Thank you for joining us. And welcome to this virtual board meeting of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Robert Sumwalt. I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the NTSB. And joining us today are my colleagues on the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, Member Jennifer Homedy, Member Michael Graham, and Member Tom Chapman. Today we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider the collision between a pickup truck with a trailer and a group of motorcycles in Randolph, New Hampshire on June the 21st of last year. 15 motorcyclists and their seven passengers had just left their motel and were traveling eastbound on US-2 in a staggered formation. In the westbound lane, a pickup truck towing an empty vehicle trailer approached. Shortly after the motorcyclist got underway, the truck crossed the road center line and struck the lead motorcycle, beginning a crash sequence that ultimately involved 13 of the 15 motorcycles. Five riders and two passengers died as a result of the crash. And that same number, five riders and two passengers were injured. On behalf of all of us at the NTSB, I'd like to offer our sincere condolences to the family and friends of all of those who've been affected by this horrible, horrible, needless tragedy. And please understand that the reason for our investigation of this tragedy, and thus today's board meeting, is to learn from this crash to prevent similar tragedies from occurring in the future. In every such case, we look at three things. We look at the, the, the human, the machine, and the environment. In today's board meeting, our investigators will explain how the pickup truck and the lead motorcycle came into contact and the effect of the first contact of the trucks and the truck's subsequent path. They'll also present what they learned about the driver of the pickup truck, which led us to the hiring practices at Westfield Transport, the company where the driver had just been driving for two days as well as the actions and the inactions of state and federal agencies. For example, the truck driver's license had been suspended in Connecticut a month earlier. It would have also been suspended in Massachusetts, but for a processing error. And today we'll have the opportunity to discuss deficiencies and out-of-state driver's license notification processing that existed at the time of the crash. Now, I should note that Massachusetts did take steps post-crash in response to this issue, and we'll have the opportunity to discuss just how effective that response was, and we'll also discuss insufficient federal oversight of motor carriers and shortcomings in motorcycle rider safety. Each board member has studied the draft report, and each of us have met individually with the investigative staff. Today's board meeting, however, is the first time that we as a deliberative body will have gathered to discuss the report. Today, the staff will lay out the pertinent facts and analysis found in the draft report, and they'll present the draft findings, a probable cause, and recommendations to the board. And then we on the board will question the staff to ensure that the report as we consider its adoption today, truly provides the best opportunity to enhance safety. The public docket for this report contains more than 1,300 pages of additional relevant material, and it's available on our website at www.ntsb.gov. And the report that we will approve today will also be available on our website in just a few weeks after any Amendments voted upon today are incorporated and the report is finalized for release. So at this time, I'd like for each of my colleagues on the board to introduce themselves. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's good to see you. Member Hominy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to the staff. I look forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you very much. Member Graham. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, fellow board members. Uh, 
investigative team and staff. I look forward to our deliberations today. Thank you, and Member Chapman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our team for excellent work on this investigation. Yeah, I agree. I think the investigative staff has done a really nice job with this. So at this time, I'll ask our Deputy Managing Director for Investigations, Brian Curtis, to, in to introduce the investigative and support staff who will be participating in today's board meeting. Good morning, Mr. Curtis. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Sumwell. My only administrative announcement this morning is a reminder for the meeting participants to silence all electronic devices at this time. I'll now introduce the staff for today's meeting. On the panel this morning, unless otherwise noted, are the following staff members from the Office of Highway Safety. Dr. Robert Malloy, Director for the Office of Highway Safety. Dr. Ensar Bechik, Project Manager. Kenneth Bragg, Investigator in Charge. Dennis Collins, Driver Licensing and Human Performance. Michael Fox, Motor Carrier Safety and Oversight. Ronald Kaminsky, Motorcycle Helmets and Survival Factors. Ryan Bergonier, Motorcycle Safety and Vehicle Factors. Robert Squire, Reconstruction. Dan Walsh, Highway Factors. Dr. Mary Pat McKay, Medical Officer from the Office of Research and Engineering. Darlene Hatchett, Director of the Safety Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Casey Blaine, Deputy Director for the Office of General Counsel. James Ritter, Director for the Office of Research and Engineering. Julie Perot, Recommendation Specialist from the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Steve Blackestone, Government Affairs from the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Mark Banyard, Audiovisual from the Office of Highway Safety. Dr. Chris Poland, Deputy Director and Acting Report Development Chief for the Office of Highway Safety. And Monica Mitchell, Report Editor from the Office of Highway Safety. The presentations will begin with an investigation overview by the investigator in charge, Kenneth Bragg. Good morning, Chairman Somal, Vice Chairman Landsberg, members Hamidi, Graham, and Chapman. This morning, staff will present an investigation of a highway crash involving a pickup truck towing a trailer and a group of motorcycles that occurred in Randolph, New Hampshire. The crash occurred on Friday evening, June 21st, at about 6.26 p.m. local time in the rural community of Randolph in Coas County, New Hampshire. The approximate location of Randolph is shown by the red marker. The day of the crash, the pick, pickup truck driver left his home in Westville, Massachusetts to pick up a, a vehicle in Mechanicville, New York. He delivered the vehicle to a car dealership in Berlin, New Hampshire. The pickup truck departed New Hampshire, uh, departed Berlin at about 16 p.m., traveling south on State Highway 16. After nearing the Gorham area, the pickup truck traveled west on U.S. Highway 2. The crash occurred at about 6.26 p.m. when the pickup truck reached Randolph. This aerial photograph shows the relatively straight section of U.S. Highway 2 where the crash occurred. Leading up to the crash, a group of 15 motorcycles departed the Mount Jefferson View Inn traveling east on U.S. Highway 2, shown here by the yellow line. Meanwhile, the pickup truck was traveling west on U.S. Highway 2, shown here by the blue line, while approaching the motorcycle formation. The crash happened less than a half mile from the end when the pickup truck crossed into the eastbound lane, as indicated by the red marker. The lower figure shows the staggered riding positions of the 13 motorcycles that were involved in the crash. The yellow arrow indicates the eastbound direction of travel. The diagram shows roadway evidence and the final rest position of the pickup truck. The red circle in the diagram shows the location of the first impact between the pickup truck and the first motorcycle. The position of the vehicles relative to each other are shown in the red box at the top. As the westbound pickup truck approached the first motorcycle, the left wheels of the pickup truck were on the center line. The eastbound motorcycle was traveling near the center line. 
The second impact occurred further into the eastbound lane when the motorcycle traveling directly behind the first was struck by the left front corner of the pickup truck. After the second impact, the pickup truck veered sharply to the left and its right front struck motorcycle five. Motorcycle seven then collided with the rear of motorcycle five. The fourth impact occurred when the motorcycle eight fell to the roadway and was struck by the right side of the trailer. The final impact occurred well into the eastbound lane when the front of the pickup truck collided with motorcycle 10, then 11. Afterwards, the pickup truck departed the roadway and came to rest on an embankment adjacent to the eastbound shoulder. A fire ensued that engulfed the pickup truck and two of the motorcycles. This is a photograph of the pickup truck and two of the motorcycles at final rest. The motorcycles are circled in yellow. As a result of this crash, five motorcycle riders and two passengers were fatally injured. One motorcycle rider was seriously injured and four motorcycle riders and two passengers sustained minor injuries. The pickup truck driver was not injured. This slide lists the on-scene investigative staff. This slide lists the report development staff. The parties to the investigation were the New Hampshire State Police, the Photo Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and the U.S. Department of Transportation's Office of the Inspector General. After assessing the events of this crash, staff identified the following safety issues. Deficiencies in out-of-state driver license notification processing, insufficient federal oversight of motor carriers, and shortcomings in motorcycle rider safety. This morning, staff will give presentations on the driving performance of the pickup truck driver, communication about license suspension information between states, federal oversight of the motor carrier in this crash, motorcycle helmet safety, and motorcycle rider safety. Mr. Collins will give the first presentation. Good morning. I will be presenting on the actions of the pickup driver as they pertain to the crash, as well as issues uncovered regarding the communication about license suspension information between states. In this presentation, I will cover the human performance factors of the pickup driver we were able to exclude as causal or contributory in the crash, the pickup driver's actions, his statements following the crash, his substance abuse, and his fatigue, and issues uncovered with the communication about license information between states. Alcohol use by some of the motorcycle riders will be discussed by Mr. Begonier in his presentation. As a result of our investigation, we were able to exclude the following factors related to human performance. The pickup driver had only about two years of commercial driving experience, but there was nothing about the roadway or environment requiring specific experience. Staff also notes a commercial license was not needed to operate the pickup truck. Service provider records show the pickup driver was not using his cell phone to talk or text at or near the time of the crash. And the weather was fair, the visibility was good, and the roadway was dry. As Mr. Bragg mentioned in his presentation, there is evidence the wheel of the pickup truck was on the center line at the first collision. The driver stated he was reaching for a drink and that was why he drifted from his lane. However, multiple witnesses reported seeing the pickup truck driving erratically, even intruding into the opposite lane of travel. These observations took place throughout the day, including less than a minute before the crash. This type of operation is not consistent with reaching for a drink. The driver voluntarily provided a blood sample for toxicological testing, and it was taken about two hours after the crash. The physical evidence and the reports of erratic driving led to the driver's arrest three days after the crash. At the time of his arrest, he told police that he was using heroin and cocaine and had been doing so for years. He used heroin and cocaine the morning of the crash, and he was feeling the effects of the drugs leading up to the crash and was drinking a caffeinated beverage to take the edge off. Analysis of the pickup truck driver's blood sample showed fentanyl and metabolites of fentanyl, 
heroin, and cocaine. The levels of those substances indicate the driver had used drugs within 12 hours of the crash. Staff believes the pickup driver's crossing of the center line likely occurred because of his impairment from use of multiple drugs. However, the combination makes it impossible to determine the specific effects of any single drug on the driver's performance at the time of the crash. As is typical, staff used information from multiple sources to examine the potential for the driver to be fatigued. As shown in the graph, the evidence suggests the driver had only about two and a half hours of consecutive time and a total of four hours available for rest overnight from June 18th to June 19th. On the night of June 19th into the 20th, he had eight hours available to rest, but most likely did so in the pickup truck's non-compliant sleeper berth which would result in poor quality rest. On the night of June 20th into the 21st, the driver had about seven and a half hours to rest. It is likely the driver was experiencing some fatigue at the time of the crash. However, any effect from this fatigue would have been secondary to and masked by his use of drugs. Investigators learned the driver was stopped in East Windsor, Connecticut for suspicion of driving under the influence on May 11th, 2019, just 45 days before the crash. He failed a standardized field sobriety test, was arrested, and refused a urine drug test. Under Connecticut law, drivers licensed in another state who refuse to submit to toxicological testing have their non-resident driving privileges immediately suspended for 24 hours, and after not more than 30 days to allow for hearing, suspended again for at least 45 days. The pickup truck driver was licensed by Massachusetts. On May 29, 2019, the Connecticut Department of Motor Vehicles, or DMV, sent an electronic notice to the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles, or RMV, detailing the suspension of the driver's non-resident driving privileges. The conviction date was June 10, 2019, 12 days later, due to the required waiting period. When Connecticut failed to receive confirmation that the electronic notice was processed, a paper notice was also sent to Massachusetts. Massachusetts law states that if the RMB is notified that the holder of a Massachusetts driver's license has their license or right to operate suspended, revoked, or canceled in another state, the RMV shall revoke their license immediately until the driver is reinstated by the other state. The pickup truck driver's license should therefore have been revoked on June 10, 2019, and would not have been restored until at least July 25th, 2019. However, because neither the electronic nor the paper notice from Connecticut was processed, the pickup truck driver's license was not revoked prior to the Randolph crash. After the crash, the Massachusetts RMV became aware of the unprocessed Connecticut notices, prompting them to conduct both an internal audit and an external review. These found that the electronic notification was received by the RMV's dedicated software called Atlas on the day it was sent, May 29, 2019. However, Atlas could not automatically process a notification with a future date and therefore diverted it into a manual processing queue. The manual queue was unmonitored and, in fact, had never been monitored and had been collecting notices since the deployment of Atlas in March of 2016. Post-crash, a total of 365 notices were in the queue. Only three had not been resolved via other means, and only the pickup truck driver warranted an automatic suspension. The paper notice from Connecticut was received by the RMV on June 4th, 2019. For ultimately undetermined reasons, RMV personnel had stopped processing all out-of-state paper notifications in 2013. This photograph, taken in 2017, shows boxes and boxes of unprocessed paper notices. The internal audit ultimately uncovered tens of thousands of unprocessed paper notifications. After reviewing the paper notices and the records of all 5.2 million Massachusetts drivers, the RMV suspended the licenses of more than 5,000 additional drivers. The vast majority of these were non-commercial licenses. The audit and review also uncovered evidence that institutionally, the RMV was aware of the unprocessed paper notifications. The audit and review determined the RMV had failed to properly process out-of-state notifications handled by two different systems for years. 
Problem drivers went unaddressed, meaning the two systems were ineffective. Staff believes that had the RMV had effective systems in place to promptly revoke driver's licenses based on out-of-state notifications, the pickup truck driver's license would have been revoked before the Randolph crash. The case of the pickup driver and the additional suspensions after the audit demonstrate that systematic deficiencies in RMV operations and the inaction to rectify a known problem resulted in the RMV failing to revoke the pickup truck driver's commercial driver's license, as well as the licenses of many non-commercial Massachusetts drivers with infractions or suspensions in other states. RMV has taken several steps to address the uncovered deficiencies, including modifying Atlas to be able to process future actions, creating a new organizational unit, the out-of-state unit, and assigning all out-of-state notifications, incoming, outgoing, CDL, non-CDL, paper, and electronic to this out-of-state unit, creating workflows for out-of-state notifications, assigning specific personnel to process notifications, and requiring that management be updated daily on the status of out-of-state notifications. Staff believes the post-crash system changes by the Massachusetts RMV represent progress towards addressing the substantial deficiencies in RMV operations that existed at the time of the crash, and if maintained, will reduce the likelihood of drivers with a history of impaired driving retaining a Massachusetts driver's license. But as the NTSB has often stated, safety cannot be static. In order to ensure systems are effective, they need to be monitored and adjusted as needed. For this reason, staff is proposing a recommendation to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to develop appropriate metrics and establish a process to regularly evaluate the effectiveness of the RMV's processing of out-of-state notifications, both incoming and outgoing for CDL and non-CDL holders. Unfortunately, issues with the processing of out-of-state violations do not appear to be limited to Massachusetts. For example, Rhode Island transportation officials found more than 22,500 unreported infractions and suspensions of Massachusetts drivers. New Hampshire reported 13,015 out-of-state notifications, resulting in the suspension of 3,852 drivers, including seven CDL drivers. Out-of-state notification issues have also been reported in at least six additional jurisdictions. Considering the problems uncovered in Massachusetts and other states, staff believe safety could be greatly enhanced by improving interstate communication about driving offenses, including promptly sending notifications to other states and expeditiously processing incoming out-of-state notifications. Accordingly, staff is proposing that jurisdictions accept Massachusetts review their existing procedures or develop new ones to accurately and expeditiously process notifications received from other states and to notify jurisdictions of infractions and suspensions by drivers licensed in those jurisdictions. In summary, with respect to the pickup driver, staff was able to exclude experience and cell phone use as factors, but was not able to determine the effect of fatigue. He had a history of drug use and had multiple drugs and metabolites in his system at the time of the crash. And the driver most likely crossed the center line as the result of impairment resulting from his use of multiple drugs. With respect to the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles, the RMV should have revoked the pickup driver's license prior to the crash. The RMV was not properly processing out-of-state notifications, either electronic or paper, and the changes made by the RMV represent progress, but periodic monitoring is needed. Staff also determined that issues with out-of-state notifications are not limited to Massachusetts and is proposing other U.S. licensing jurisdictions examine their own processes. This concludes my presentation. Mr. Fox will give the next presentation on federal oversight of motor carriers. Good morning. In this presentation, I will discuss Westfield Transport operations, including both pre-crash operations and discuss the findings of the post-crash compliance review that was conducted by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, or FMCSA. Next, I will discuss the FMCSA's post-crash oversight of Westfield Transport 
and then examine the FMCSA historic use of imminent hazard orders. Lastly, I will discuss the FMCSA's oversight of electronic logging device providers. Westfield Transport was a for hire interstate motor carrier that was domiciled in West Springfield, Massachusetts. The carrier obtained their US DOT number on July 2016 and began their operations with one truck trailer combination and one driver. Their business model was transporting automobiles in the Northeast. The carrier exited the new entrant program on January 9, 2018. At the time of the crash, the carrier was operating eight vehicles and 12 drivers, and the carrier had three basics and alert status and was classified as moderate risk by the FMCSA. Basics are the evaluation metric that FMCSA uses to evaluate roadside data and determine if an intervention is required. The post-crash investigation of Westfield Transport showed significant non-compliance with the regulations. The compliance review resulted in 25 total violations, four acute, three critical, and 18 additional violations that resulted in an unsatisfactory safety rating. In addition, the carrier had no drug testing program, no safety plan, no written policies, and did not conduct any training for their drivers. Furthermore, the, car the motor carrier also lied to investigators about specific trips and falsified their ELDs. Numerous issues were identified with the carrier's blatant disregard for the safety regulations. Regarding the accident driver, the carrier had incomplete driver qualification or DQ files, did not obtain a background check or other required documents. Had Westfield done so, they would have learned that the accident driver had a rollover crash in Texas just one week prior to starting employment at Westfield, and the driver had a history of drug abuse. Additionally, Westfield failed to provide adequate oversight for their other drivers they employed. Other violations included incomplete DQ files, using a driver with a revoked CDL, drivers tampered with their ELDs, and investigators found that 28 out of 150 logs reviewed had been falsified. Considering that the post-crash investigation revealed Westport Transport to be in severe non-compliance with the federal regulations, it is reasonable to question how the carrier was allowed to reach such a high level of disregard. To answer this question, we examine the specific periods of Westfield Transport's operation during which the FMCSA could have had opportunity to detect the carrier's unsafe actions before the crash. Specifically, we examine the carrier's history during the new entrant program in which carriers are subject to a safety audit and increased scrutiny, and the period following the new entrant program when Westfield was subject to standard oversight. I will use this table to describe how Westfield Transport's manner of operation also affected the amount of oversight it received from the FMCSA. As already stated, Westfield Transport entered the new entrant program July 2016. During the 18-month period of the program, the carrier operated with mostly only one vehicle and had seven total roadside inspections, which resulted in two out-of-service violations and had between zero and one basic and alert status depending on the date. These violations and alerts were below the critical threshold and the carrier was deemed as sufficiently safe to graduate from the program. After Westfield Transport exited the new entrant program, it started ramping up its operation. During the next 13 months, the carrier expanded from two vehicles to 11. The number of roadside inspections increased tremendously, which resulted in 15 out of service violations and one to two basics and alert status, depending on the date examined. As a result of the high number of out of service violations, in February 2019, five months before the crash, the carrier had three alerts in basic, which prompted the FMCSA to classify it as a moderate risk carrier. 
For the next five months until the crash, the carrier underwent more roadside inspections, which resulted in more out of service violations and the carrier retained three alerts in BASIC during this period. What we can see from this table is that more data from more roadside inspections allowed the FMCSA to categorize Westfield Transport as a moderate risk carrier five months before the crash. But the process was too slow for FMCSA to determine the extent to which this was an egregiously unsafe carrier. While the FMCSA oversight process was slow for this carrier, the new entrant program does have success. Approximately one third of carriers do not complete the new entrant program because they either fail the safety audit or have an expedited action taken against them. In the FMCSA's current oversight system, a carrier that has just completed the new entrant program receives the same scrutiny as a carrier that has been operating for decades. However, a carrier that rapidly increases the number of vehicles in its operation immediately after exiting the new entrant program dramatically accumulates violations from increased roadside inspections and accrues two basic alerts four months later, as Westfield Transport did, may require a different level of scrutiny. The FMCSA should establish a layer of oversight for motor carriers who are recent graduates of the new entrant program that has a lower tolerance for unsafe operations. Staff is proposing a recommendation to address this issue area. During the investigation, we discovered that Westfield had affiliations with 21 other carriers, elements that range from common addresses and multiple drivers and vehicles. Westfield had characteristics indicative of potential for reincarnation. When a motor carrier attempts to avoid and elude FMCSA oversight by reestablishing the company under another name, it is referred as a reincarnated carrier. While on scene, investigators identified other affiliations to Westfield. One such carrier, Dax Express, had its principal place of business associated with the crash involved driver. However, the NTSB determined that the owners of Dex Express did not live at this address and their residence as well as their fleet was in Florida. Another example is shortly after Westfield Transport went out of business, another carrier called East to West Transport started operations. The NTSB determined that East to West was owned by one of Westfield Transport drivers and was operating with six of Westfield's vehicles. One of the tools that the FMCSA has, ha, has at their disposal to deal with reincarnated carrier is the imminent hazard order. An imminent hazard order is typically a reactive tool, but it can also be used in a proactive application. It can prevent a carrier from reincarnating by banning its owners, managers, and drivers from being employed by other motor carriers and prevent its vehicles from being registered by another carrier. During the investigation, the FMCSA investigator initiated imminent hazard paperwork. However, FMCSA did not issue the imminent hazard order. In a formal reply to the NTSB, the FMCSA stated that the imminent hazard was not, the standard was not met and none of the violations discovered impacted the June 21st, 2019 crash. And further added, it is clear that the company is now defunct and no longer operating. As discussed earlier in my presentation, Westfield Transport's actions clearly did directly impact the crash by allowing the driver to be behind the wheel at the time of the crash. As stated, FMCSA decided not to issue the imminent hazard order against Westfield Transport. We recognize the value of imminent hazard orders in removing unsafe carriers from operation. As such, the NTSB made a recommendation to the FMCSA following crash in Naperville, Illinois, to review the process for imminent hazard orders and identify ways in which it can be improved. Unfortunately, the FMCSA has made no progress with this safety recommendation. In fact, the FMCSA use of imminent hazard orders 
has been very inconsistent as well as infrequent. For example, in 2017, FMCSA issued several imminent hazard orders against carriers based on the same or less severe violations uncovered during the post-crash CR of Westfield Transport. This table shows the 20-year history of IH orders issued from FMCSA. From 2009 through 2014, there were 112 imminent hazard orders issued. But from 2015 until 2020, the FMCSA issued only 17. So, imminent hazard orders are an effective tool in removing unsafe carrier from operation, as well as preventing a carrier's future reincarnation. As such, staff proposes reiterating the recommendation in the Naperville report and proposes its reclassification. The FMCSA instituted the electronic logging device mandate to make hours of service record keeping accurate and to prevent falsification, which has been a systemic issue with the paper logs. Westfield Transport used Keep Trucking, who is an ELT provider that is on the FMCSA approved vendor list. Our investigation discovered that the first trip the accident driver made involved freight that was obtained by the carrier owner who falsified his logs by disconnecting his ELD from the wireless connection to the device. In another NTSB crash investigation in Thoreau, New Mexico in August of 2018, a tractor trailer crossed the median and struck a motor coach killing eight. The NTSB discovered the tractor trailer driver also disabled his keep trucking onboard recording device to falsify his logs. ELDs are supposed to be tamper proof. And if they are, the device is supposed to generate a fault code to alert law enforcement or a roadside inspector that an ELD has been compromised. Staff is proposing a recommendation to remove keep trucking from the FMCSA approved vendor list and revise the process for ELDs to become approved. In summary, this crash was preventable. Our investigation determined that Westfield Transport was in severe noncompliance of the regulations and operated without regard for safety. FMCSA's oversight for Westfield was inadequate. Staff is proposing recommendations that would help strengthen FMCSA's oversight of recent graduates of the new entrant program and ELD providers. This concludes my presentation. Mr. Kaminsky has the next presentation on motorcycle helmet safety. Good morning. Good morning. In this presentation, I'll be focusing on the injuries and helmet usage on the 13 motorcycle riders and five passengers involved in the crash. I'll also be discussing the importance of Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 218, which establishes minimum performance requirements for motorcycle helmets, the benefits of wearing USDOT compliant helmets, and lastly, I'll discuss previous NTSB recommendations regarding motorcycle helmets. This slide illustrates the injury sustained to the motorcyclist while in the formation. As shown in red, five motorcycle riders and two passengers died in this crash. Based on the autopsy reports, the five deceased motorcycle riders and two passengers sustained blunt force trauma to multiple body regions. The rider leading the formation sustained severe blunt force trauma to his head and died as a result of that injury. One rider sustained serious injuries. He was riding directly behind the lead rider. Of the remaining motorcyclists, four riders and two passengers sustained minor injuries, and three riders and one passenger were uninjured. The 23-year-old pickup driver was also uninjured. We also examined the motorcyclist's use of the primary protective gear they have in a crash, the helmet. Because it protects the head, a helmet is the most important component of that protective gear. We interviewed the majority of surviving motorcyclists and examined all evidence to ascertain the use of helmets. Of the 18 motorcyclists we discussed, 12 were wearing a US DOT compliant helmet, one was wearing a non-compliant helmet, the lead rider most likely was not wearing any helmet, 
and the helmet used for the remaining four motorcyclists is unknown. The motorcycle helmet use should also be examined within the context of the state law. Specifically, New Hampshire, which does not require motorcycle riders or passengers to wear helmets. Motorcycle helmets are the last line of defense in case of a crash. And in this crash, of the seven motorcyclists who died, three were wearing U.S. DOT compliant helmets and the helmet use for the three other deceased motorcyclists is unknown. As already stated, the lead rider who was struck first most likely was not wearing a helmet. But the circumstances of this crash, specifically the speed, mass, and direction of travel of the oncoming combination vehicle created a challenging environment for motorcyclists' protective gear to save lives. Six motorcyclists, six motorcycles carrying eight motorcyclists were directly struck by the pickup truck or its trailer during the crash sequence. Only one of the riders survived with serious injuries. While the circumstances of this crash were very challenging, the effectiveness of motorcycle helmets has been consistently demonstrated. The NHTSA has shown that helmets are 37% effective in preventing rider fatalities and 41% effective for passengers. Based on these effectiveness analysis, NHTSA was able to present the benefits of helmet use in terms of lives saved. By examining, the motor, examining motorcycle crashes in 2017, NHTSA showed that the U.S. DOT compliant helmets saved over 1,800 lives in 2017. Furthermore, the agency showed that another 749 lives could have been saved that year had the riders and passengers involved in those fatal crashes worn helmets. So the answer seems to be clear. The rate of motorcycle fatalities could be considerably reduced with the widespread use of US DOT compliant helmets. How do we get there? In 2019, the national average rate of helmet use was 71%. Since data shows that helmets save lives, some states have used mandates to increase their usage. Currently, 18 states and the District of Columbia have mandatory universal helmet use laws requiring compliant helmets for all riders in those states. The helmet use in 2019 was 89%. Currently, 29 states have partial laws that typically only cover motorcyclists younger than 18, and three states Iowa, Illinois, and as previously mentioned, New Hampshire have no helmet use laws. In these states, the helmet use drops to only 56%. In part, based on these clear differences in use across states, NTSB has made recommendations. In 2006, the NTSB conducted a motorcycle safety forum that addressed multiple initiatives and safety countermeasures to reduce the likelihood of motorcycle crashes and fatalities. As a result of the public forum, the NTSB issued safety recommendations to states addressing universal helmet use laws, H0738 through H0740. One recommendation was issued to the states without any helmet use laws, including New Hampshire. For the majority of states, the status of these recommendations are all open, unacceptable response. The high rate of, of annual motorcycle fatalities since the issuance of the 2007 recommendations has persisted. Almost 5,000 motorcyclists died in 2018. Due to the lack of progress of these recommendations, renewed focus is needed. In summary, US DOT compliant helmets have been shown to provide the best protection for motorcyclists when a crash occurs and state universal helmet use laws increase the use of US DOT compliant helmets in those states. Therefore, the NTSB staff is proposing to reiterate safety recommendations H0738, 39, and 40. In closing, US DOT compliant helmets can save lives, but only when motorcyclists use them. This concludes my presentation, and Mr. Bergone, you will now present other motorcycle safety issues. Good morning. In his presentation, Mr. Kaminsky addressed the importance of motorcycle helmets in the event of a crash. 
In my presentation, I will talk about avoiding crashes in the first place. I'll describe how rider assistance technology, such as analog braking systems or ABS work, and discuss the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, regulations regarding motorcycle ABS. Finally, I will address choices all motorcycle riders can, take, can make to improve safety, including never riding impaired, ensuring adequate spacing within motorcycle formations. Motorcycles inherently have reduced stability at low speeds or during wheel lockup. ABS improves stability by preventing lockup, which enables steering while still maximizing braking force. This increases the rider's ability to bring the motorcycle to a controlled stop. Motorcycles without ABS are associated with a 109% increased crash risk relative to ABS equipped motorcycles. Four of the 13 motorcycles involved in this crash were equipped with ABS. In a post-crash interview with NTSB investigators, two riders with ABS on their motorcycles stated they felt the technology assisted them in coming to a controlled stop, possibly avoiding becoming more extensively involved in this crash. Staff has concluded that ABS likely aided those riders in performing emergency braking during the crash sequence. Although NHTSA has required ABS on passenger vehicles since 2000, it does not require ABS on motorcycles, despite numerous studies showing its effectiveness at preventing crashes. NHTSA does have a performance standard for motorcycle ABS if so equipped. Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, or FMVSS 122, specifies the ABS performance requirements for motorcycles. The NTSB believes broad deployment of ABS technology would reduce the crash risk for motorcycle riders. In 2018, the NTSB recommended that NHTSA require all new motorcycles for road use be equipped with ABS. This recommendation is classified as open, unacceptable response. Although alcohol impaired operation considerably increases the crash risk for operators of all types of roadway vehicles, motorcycle riders are at particular risk. In 2016, 25% of all motorcycle rider fatalities had a blood alcohol content or BAC greater than 0.08 grams per deciliter. Motorcycle riders also exhibit performance deficit even at lower BACs. Research conducted on a closed track shows that motorcycle rider's response time to a potential hazard increases with a BAC as low as 0.05. Post-crash, the five riders who died were tested for alcohol as part of the post-mortem exam, and one injured rider was tested for alcohol during treatment. Four of the six riders tested positive for alcohol. The lead rider in the formation who was killed had a BAC above New Hampshire's per se limit of 0.08 grams per deciliter. Although the roadway evidence in this crash indicates that the combination vehicle crossed the center line at a shallow angle, the evidence provides no indication of how long the vehicle was straddling the center line before crossing, several seconds or less than a second. If the crash had developed rapidly, the combination vehicle straddled the center line momentarily before crossing, even an attentive and unimpaired driver, rider would have had little time to react to the encroachment by the combination vehicle. Therefore, Although the lead rider was impaired by alcohol, the extent to which his impairment impeded his ability to execute an invasive maneuver could not be determined. Staff found that although alcohol impairment increases a motorcycle rider's response time to potential hazard, the rapid progression of impacts in this crash, along with the tight spacing, made it unlikely for most riders behind the lead motorcycle to avoid the oncoming pickup truck. At the time of this crash, the motorcyclists were riding in a staggered formation, which creates a left and right column within the lane of travel. The New Hampshire Motorcycle Operator Manual suggests riders maintain a two second following distance between motorcycles on the same side of a formation. The involved riders entered the roadway less than 1100 feet prior to the crash and had no time to develop a complete formation or create appropriate spacing. This crash provides an opportunity to remind motorcyclists of the importance of choosing to make safety their number one goal. Staff has proposed a recommendation to the National Association of State Motorcycle Safety Administrators and the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, asking that they tell their members about this crash and reiterate the safety benefits of choosing ABS-equipped motorcycles, riding unimpaired, safe spacing when riding in groups, 
and wearing DOT compliant helmets. In summary, while ABS is an effective proven safety system on all motor vehicles, NHTSA does not require it on motorcycles. Motorcyclists must always choose safe riding strategies, including never riding after consuming alcohol, proper following distances, and wearing a DOT compliant helmet. This concludes my presentation. Staff is prepared to answer any questions the board members may have. Well, thank you very much for those presentations, which really uh, shown, shined good uh, light on various issues regarding this crash. And at this time, we will turn to the board member questions. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to learn a little bit more about this uh, reincarnation uh, situation. And um, could you elaborate just a little more on that? Um, how many times did you say this company was reincarnated? Um, Westfield Transport was not reincarnated at the time of the crash. It had uh, common elements that included uh, drivers and vehicles and other elements. Uh, it had a very high potential for re reincarnation. So um, would a stronger reincarnation prevention protocol uh, have helped in this case? It, it seems like uh, the the owner is, is kind of showing up time and time again. Am, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, sir. And, and one of the ways uh, to prevent reincarnation is the imminent hazard order. It can be a proactive application uh, to help remove unsafe carriers and more importantly, prevent reincarnation. And as such, uh, staff is proposing to reiterate H-16-1 and propose its reclassification. So, um, and the purpose of reincarnation is for the purposes of evading law enforcement. Um, do I understand that correctly? It's to, it's to elude FMCSA's oversight, typically a carrier that may have been shut down or has uh, tremendously bad roadside data may uh, just uh, go off the grid, if we could use that term, and just pop up or morph into another entity under a new name, but it's basically the same entire new company. It's the same company that was in the previous uh, DOT number, just it's become a, new a whole new entity. So in your opinion, or does the data support that um, uh, FMCSA was not performing proper oversight relative to this reincarnation aspect. There are other areas that we know they didn't do properly, but uh, um, in this area specifically of reincarnation. Uh, staff believes that uh, FMCSA should have issued an imminent hazard order on Westfield. Well, yeah, we the whole imminent hazard situation is um, uh, problematic here. I, I noticed uh, that out of the last four years, um, they had a, a very few, in fact, the last four fiscal years, only four had been issued and zero in the last two years. That's, that, that's just on a national basis, that's astounding. I, I, I don't know what to say. How, how would this be improved? Well, as, as mentioned, uh, staff believes that uh, the imminent hazard tool is, is very effective. It can eliminate unsafe carriers and take them immediately off the road and prevent them from reincarnating. And that's why staff believes that, uh, you know, we, sh we need to reiterate H-16-1, which would help strengthen the IH process. Do we have any sense as to why uh, FMCSA is not uh, doing this? Um, I, I have no idea, uh, Vice Chairman. That's, um, are they even meeting their own standards? Uh, I believe we heard during the presentation that um, they said that an imminent hazard order was not appropriate in this case, and yet uh, in our review of it, uh, we determined that it was. Do, do I remember that correctly? Yes, sir. There's other uh, instances where the board has conducted crash investigations and 
FMCSA has issued imminent hazard orders. So uh, they're rather uh, infrequent and inconsistent uh, at best in issuing imminent hazard orders. Well, I would, I think uh, I'm in, in firm agreement with your uh, recommendation on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop here and, and uh, I'll wait for the next round. Uh, thank you very much. You're quite welcome, Vice Chairman Landsberg and Member Homedy. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to put an exclamation on that. Um, Mr. Fox, can you go ahead and pull your camera up? This is not a surprise to FMCSA that these are serious issues, and let me tell you why. So for the past several years, the DOTIG has issued an annual report on top management and safety challenges to DOT. And almost every year, the DOTIG has stated essentially the following, and this was issued in October, but comes up every year in some new version. FMCSA must provide robust oversight of compliance with requirements for CDL programs. This includes, for example, monitoring medical examiners. Uh, FMCSA must take steps to identify and prevent fraud, uh, including medical examination fraud, and address the issue of reincarnated carriers. So this is not a new issue. And just to put an even finer point on that, this is issue actually goes back to 1999 when FA, the Office of Motor Carriers was in FHWA and the DOTIG did in-depth investigations of the Office of Motor Carriers at the time and found that they were not issuing imminent hazard orders and a number of other uh, is safety issues were not being addressed. So Congress created the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And at the time, uh, the DOTIG found, we concluded, this is 1999, we concluded in a comprehensive report that there were fundamental deficiencies in the motor carrier safety enforcement program. These included low fines, weak sanctions, few compliance reviews, failure to enforce safety regulations, a lack of shutdown orders, also known as imminent hazard orders for unsafe carriers, and a shift in emphasis from enforcement to a more collaborative collaborative partnership with the industry. The problem is FMCSA, whether it was Office of Motor Carriers or FMCSA during various administrations have failed to conduct adequate enforcement of motor commercial motor carriers. And at the time in 1999, FMCSA's mission was what? Safety is the highest priority. I would say safety is not the highest priority of FMCSA. If you've issued four imminent hazards uh, uh, in um, four years, in the previous eight years, a different administration, it was well over 100, 127, I think. That's still low. In the administration before that, it was 14, and it wasn't even applicable to freight carriers. And so there's a history of there of serious problems. So what I, I want you to talk about for, for just go back and talk about FMCSA, the hours of service violations uh, that, um, that were identified for Westfield. Uh, during the uh, post-crash compliance review, 28. Uh, no, for, before, uh, yeah. There were 23 out of service violations. What is the hour of service rate for their drivers? Uh, for their drivers, I believe it was 20.8%. What's the national average? 5.5%. So four times the national average and they were flagged for unsafe driving, hours of service compliance and driver fitness and were considered a moderate risk carrier Yet, how many warning letters did they receive? Uh, they received one. One warning letter. When yes. did they get their compliance review? They never had a compliance review until after the crash. After the crash. So yes. you have a moderate risk carrier that didn't receive a compliance review until after a crash, after people died. 
it, it seems to me that more should have been done. So do you think FMCSA was providing appropriate safety oversight of Westfield? Well, that is why staff is proposing a recommendation to uh, have FMCSA have an extra layer of oversight for recently graduated new entrant carriers, such as Westfield, where they ramp up operations, have a very high out of service rate unexpectedly. They started out with one truck and then they morphed into this uh, rather large company with a lot of out of service. And that's why FMCSA or staff is proposing FMCSA to add a layer of oversight to recent graduates of the new entry program. And I know my time is up, but I'm going to end with one quote from the DOTIG in April 1999 when he raised this issue, and that was Ken Mead at the time. A strong correlation exists between an inspection presence and the safety condition of trucks and personnel. This is because there is a significant economic consequence to a trucking firm when its trucks are placed out of service. When there is a strong inspection presence, there is substantial likelihood of poorly maintained trucks, unqualified drivers, unsafe drivers being detected. That's why you need oversight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Hamadi, thank you very much. Um, Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we'll stay with the imminent hazard and the uh, new entrance program. I got a few questions there. Uh, am I correct? Uh, is an imminent hazard can be ordered against a operator, but it can also be ordered against a driver. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Um, has the driver of this crash pickup been cited as an imminent hazard? No, he was not. No, he was not. Do we know why not? Um, I don't know why. Um, it was my understanding that he was going to be issued an imminent hazard as well as the carrier, but neither took place. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. How many motor carriers are out there in the U.S., roughly? There's about 600,000. 600,000 motor operators. And what we say, the last couple of years there were a single digit imminent hazard hazards ordered on these operators? Yes, sir. And roughly the new entrance program, I believe the presentation stated that in that first year, a third of them don't even make it through the program. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So with over almost 600,000 operators and only a couple imminent hazards the last couple of years each year, those numbers just don't add up to me. Uh, I, I have a hard time believing that. Um, very interesting. Um, let me ask a question here about the uh, new entrant program. Um, how many investigators, uh, FMCSA investigators, uh, how many of them uh, are out there that can do the uh, compliance review or the initial audit for a new entrant? I believe it's a little over 300 investigators uh, at the FMCSA. Okay. Now, a lot of the um, new entrant uh, safety audits are conducted by um, the MixApp agency uh, designated by the governor for each state. So it's typically a um, state police agency or a DMV that may have that type of oversight and they typically do a safety audits, but it varies from state to state. There, there may be some states that uh, FMCSA investigators conduct the safety audit as well. Do we know how many of the state auditors there might be by chance? Uh, I don't I don't have that number, so I can okay. get it for you. Well, it just it, to me, it just seems like the numbers are pretty low. And especially when you talk, if there's just over 300 FMCSA uh, auditors out there, and we have roughly 600,000 motor carriers out there. Um, that's uh, one investigator per, uh, you know, that's almost like 1,800 plus operators per inspector. That number just doesn't seem to add up. And I believe I saw a number in the in their uh, draft report that each year there's about 35,000 new entrants startups every year. And if you just divide that number in the last few years into uh, into those investigators, we're only, we're talking well over 100 audits per investigator. That number just seems kind of shy 
So um, do, you, do you guys believe, does the staff believe that FMCSA has the resources and mainly the human resources to conduct their safety business? Uh, staff believes that FMCSA uh, is, is understaffed. Understaffed, okay. Do we have a recommendation for that? I don't believe so, sir, no. Okay, we might, we might wanna look at that after this. I know we don't really have one other than the first recommendation that's going to be proposed later that we'll talk about in a bit. So, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and yield back the remainder of my time for the next round. Thank you. Member Graham, thank you very much. And uh, Member Chapman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very sadly, the circumstances of this crash underscore the rising concern regarding the impact of multi-substance impairment on transportation safety. As my colleagues know, consumption of any mood or mind altering substance can leave a driver impaired. And drug driving is on the rise, including impairment from the use of illicit drugs, prescription, and over-the-counter medications. Our own research in this area indicates the incidence of drug impaired driving is increasing at even greater rates than that of alcohol impaired driving. The problem is compounded when multiple substances are involved in combination with alcohol or with other impairing drugs. Marijuana specifically doesn't appear to be a factor in this investigation. Nevertheless, I have a question for Dr. McKay regarding legislation Congress is considering, which would remove marijuana from the list of federally banned controlled substances Dr. McKay, how might such a proposal impact federally mandated drug testing for commercial drivers and others working in safety sensitive transportation positions? Thank you for the question, Mr. Ch Member Chapman. Essentially, uh, without action being taken in the legislation that would deschedule marijuana, marijuana would fall off the DOT test list the next day because of an existing executive order that requires everything to be tested to be a Schedule One or Schedule Two drug. However, in the most recent version of the legislation that's coming before Congress in the next few weeks, we think, uh, <clears throat> there's a carve out, but it only covers currently, and this is the version that I saw yesterday morning, uh, it only covers the FAA, FMCSA, FRA, and FTA. It does not cover the Coast Guard or the drug testing that's covered as part of Homeland Security, which is where the Coast Guard and Merchant Marine currently live, and it doesn't cover pipeline. So staff firmly believes that, as you said, any impairing substance needs to be prevented from use, particularly by our commercial transportation operators, and that marijuana needs to remain on the DOT, DOT and DHS test list. Uh, thank you. And uh, you referenced the change that is is pending uh, in the House bill, at least. Um, it's 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 my understanding. I saw the same language you did. I'm I understand that that the modified version of the legislation would authorize testing for any substance which was included on the federally banned list as of a specified date. That date currently uh, in the draft legislation is December first, two thousand eighteen. So marijuana would be on the list as of that date. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation would be required to determine that such a substance has a risk to transportation safety. I understand your concern about the Homeland Security uh, element of this, and that presumably will need to be addressed as well. But setting that concern aside, what is your view of, of an approach along these lines, this modified version? So the current status, uh, based on letters from the Secretary of Transportation in the past, has clearly stated to all of the relevant commercial transportation operators we're talking about that marijuana will not be allowed, a positive marijuana test will not be made negative by a medical review officer because of the presence of a prescription. It is simply considered impairing to use marijuana while performing one of these safety sensitive jobs. And that would remain. Okay, thank you. Um, more broadly, we're calling for standardized drug testing 
and a standardized methodology to help address the challenge of drug impairment in transportation. And we stress on our most wanted list materials that we can't fully understand the scope of drug impaired driving without the data that would emerge from having a common standard of practice for drug toxicology testing. What's the state of the science in drug toxicology testing and methodology, and what are the main obstacles which must be overcome? Again, as we talked about with FMCSA, there, this is a resource problem. Uh, most of the post-accident toxicology testing that is performed is performed at the state or local jurisdiction, and they have to pay for them. And so there's great technology about identifying these substances. It's just expensive and it, you, it requires an influx of cash because you need reagents to do the testing each time. Um, what NHTSA has been working very hard on with some of our colleagues at the board is trying to get to a, a standard that states can actually reach so that the expectations can be similar across the board. We're not quite there yet. Thank you, Dr. McKay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Member Chapman, you're quite welcome. Thank you very much. And speaking of thanking, uh, I want to thank the staff for doing a very comprehensive investigation. Uh, it would have been easy to have just gone out and said, well, the this accident occurred because of, a, of an impaired driver that crossed the center line and crashed into several motorcycles. And in fact, that that's the the meat and the potatoes of the accident right there of the crash but more importantly or equally importantly you didn't stop the investigation there you looked at the at the underlying issues that really uncovered a lot of other areas that uh, that we will make recommendations on today uh, to correct those underlying issues such as the uh, the FMCSA's potential lack of oversight We're, also uh, issues regarding the uh, the RMV of Massachusetts and other states as well. So in in this case, there were failures up and down the line. So I appreciate the broad investigation that you did, and not just focus solely on the proximate issues associated with the crash. I want to talk about Westfield Transport. Uh, um, they did not provide adequate um, oversight in so many areas. They did not require an application for the accident driver. Are they required to do so? Yes, sir, they are. Thanks, Mr. Fox. And no background check for the invest uh, for the accident uh, driver, which they're required to do. Uh, the safety, they're supposed to re re review the safety performance and the driver history for, for the accident driver, which did they do that? No, sir, they did not. About drug testing. Now, granted, uh, this driver would not have been required to to have drug testing, but as I understand it, because he was not exercising the privileges of his CDL, but, uh, but Westfield Transport did have vehicles, two vehicles that did require a CDL. So should they have had a drug testing program in effect? Yes, sir, they should have, and they did not. And they did not. How about a safety plan, a written safety policies and procedures? They basically had nothing, Chairman. Basically had nothing except for an unsafe safety culture. That's what, that's one of the things they did have. They didn't maintain a driver qualification file on its drivers as they were required to do. They allowed a driver with a revoked CDL to, to drive. You talked about, well, I guess it might have been, um, uh, it might have been Dennis Collins that talked about this. Uh, they had disconnected or they had falsified uh, driver logs. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Including and, the owners. And, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I cut you out. I said, including the owners of the company, sir, they, they also falsified their logs. As I understand it, you, uh, you reviewed uh, about 150 of their logs uh, randomly, and um, you found uh, what? how many of those were falsified? 28, sir. 28. How do you falsify a log if you're using ELDs? They tampered with them. They, which disconnected, is the, they disconnected it from the a wireless device, which allowed them to basically uh, seem like they were off duty 
and then they continue to operate. And that is illegal to tamper with an ELD? Yes, sir, it is. Thank you very much. Um, if someone would pull up slide 33, I'm now going to switch to talking about the RMV. And um, I guess that's Mr. Banyard that's uh, working the slides. So slide 33, uh, I saw it this morning. And uh, when you see that picture, what what exactly is this a picture of? It was taken in 2017. So what what is this picture? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, this picture was taken by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation in 2017, and these are, in effect, bankers' boxes. Uh, I believe I counted them and got north of 60 and, and then stopped estimating, but every one of these bankers' boxes is full of paper notices from other states that were sent to the RMV that went unprocessed. When they arrived, they simply were put into boxes and stored. So when I heard that it was tens of thousands, I could not exactly comprehend what that would look like. But I think this slide right here shows us visually what tens of thousands of unprocessed paperwork would look like. Is that is that what we're looking at? Actually, I think this would be a, a portion of the tens of thousands uh, I believe we have it in the report or at least in the docket, but I think the total number of boxes uh, was larger than is shown here in the picture. Thank you very much. That in itself is disturbing. So in just a moment, I will call for a break. And before we break, uh, I would invite everyone involved to turn off your cameras and your microphones, and we will take a break until 11 o'clock. We are in recess.
And we are back in session. We'll resume with the questions. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to follow up on uh, one of your points uh, regarding the tampering with um, electronic logging devices or ELDs. On uh, page 81 of the report, we state that Westfield Transport and the drivers routinely, routinely falsified hours of service logs and tampered with the fleet's ELDs. Um, so remind us again, uh, uh, based on that investigation, how many of the logs were falsified? 28 out of 150 reviewed. Okay, so that's almost 20%, if my math is, is correct. Is this a common practice in industry to, to do this? Uh, log violations on roadside inspections are on the top 10 of the most frequent violations found during a roadside inspection. So it is fairly common that there are uh, uh, hours of service violations discovered during a roadside inspection. Even with these electronic logging devices as opposed to the paper logging devices? I would say it's probably less frequent. Uh, I'm just summarizing that it is a frequent occurrence to have an hours of service violation. What's, what's the penalty for doing that? It's typically an out of service violation and it could also result in a, 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 a traffic enforcement ticket to the driver. Well, that's a pretty light uh, sanction in aviation. If you uh, lie on a certification document, that's grounds for revocation of every certificate that you have. So um, what did Keep Trucking, this is the company that produced the device, they also claim on their website to be the number one in the industry and they support uh, 55,000 fleets and 250,000 drivers. What did they have to say as to why their devices were so easily hacked? Uh, they were basically uh, not very cooperative during the investigation. They did not respond to NTSB requests for data. So I can't comment on that. That's unfortunate. Um, I took the uh, liberty of going to their website as previously mentioned, and one of the frequently asked questions was, is the keep trucking ELD tamper resistant? And their statement, and I quote is, um, the ELD will continue to record all driving time even when the driver has not connected their mobile device to the ELD via Bluetooth. All in italics, unidentified driving events, close italics, are recorded by the ELD and eventually transmitted to keep trucking servers the next time the driver connects to the ELD. The ELD records all instances where a driver disconnects the ELD from the vehicle's diagnostic uh, port or otherwise interferes with vehicle data. They go on to say that the ELD uses GPS satellite time to prevent users from manipulating the driving time by modifying their mobile device's clock. Does this sound accurate to you? Not in our investigation, sir. Uh, it is not accurate because uh, clearly uh, the drivers at Westfield were tampering with their ELDs and were circumnavigating the system. And in another investigation in Thoreau, New Mexico, we also identified the same shortcoming. If an ELD is disconnected and has some type of a problem as we're discussing, it's supposed to produce an ELD malfunction uh, code or some type of diagnostic record that's easily identifiable by a roadside inspector or law enforcement. Well, that doesn't appear to be the case. No, um, sir. Is it true that the uh, ELD manufacturers can self-certify their devices to state that they meet all applicable standards and will provide accurate information with robust security? Yes, sir. Yes, they, they, they do self-certification. And um, this is not uncommon. NHTSA, for example, successfully self-certifies process for the safety of all their vehicles, and, and they rely on occasional testing to verify manufacturers' compliance with the safety regulations. Um, staff believes that FMCSA could also do the same type of random testing or review roadside data 
that has ELD falsification to conduct targeted evaluation of ELDs. And that is why staff is proposing a recommendation to have FMCSA review and revise the certification process by which the agency approves ELDs. Well, that, that sounds like a really good idea because I would say we're perilously close to very little or almost no certification here. Uh, it works and it works because I say it works. That, that's, that's not a very robust system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Member Hamadi. Thank you very much. And I just want to, Dr. McKay, I just wanted to let you know that during the break I did reach out to House staff and there are some, there were some provisions that were not included in the filed version and the version that will uh, be brought up on the House floor is to include both all of DOT and the Coast Guard is my understanding. So I just wanted to circle back with you on that. But while I have you, I did want to talk to you about the driver a little bit. Um, so in 2014, the driver was caught driving on a suspended license in Ohio. In December 2018, just four months after obtaining his CDL, he was fired from Universe Express for unusual behavior because of his suspected drug use. And apparently I have lighting issues right now. Six months later, he failed a field sobriety test and refused a urine drug test in Connecticut, which led to suspension of his license again. About three weeks later, he overturned a vehicle in Texas, failed to submit to a drug test requested by his employer, and was subsequently fired. His arrest for that Texas crash was actually on YouTube. If I could find it with a simple Google search of his name, others can find it as well. So how does someone like that get a CDL? And I understand that in this situation, he did not need a CDL to operate the combination vehicle he was operating, but I think there were a lot of uh, problems that led up to his employment at Westfields and certainly with Westfield. Um, in order to get a CDL, you have to get a medical exam, correct? That's correct. And who can be a medical examiner? In the United States, <clears throat> for FMCSA, anyone who is licensed by a state to perform a physical exam may be may obtain a certification as a medical examiner. So in that group are chiropractors, some physical therapists, um, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants. We've made the argument previously to FMCSA that it should require people to have uh, uh, the authority given to them by the state to prescribe medications because they will be evaluating medications that people are taking. Um, FMCSA has uh, declined to uh, make that change. Well, in, in this case, in fact, uh, the driver was evaluated by a chiropractor. I have a chiropractor. I think he's fantastic, but I would not have him complete a physical uh, and certify me in some way as medically fit to transport freight uh, in large vehicles. In this case, he was driving an 18 wheeler at some point, so that doesn't make sense. And I think we we requested information from the chiropractor in this case, but didn't receive any. Is that correct? I'm going to let uh, Dennis Collins, Mr. Collins, respond to that. Uh, <clears throat> No, ma'am. Um, the chiropractor did provide us uh, with a copy of the long form, but uh, it is my normal practice to speak with the medical examiners for the drivers uh, involved in our crashes, and he declined to be interviewed by me. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Mr. Collins. And uh, on that note, in this situation, um, when you're conducting a medical exam, you ask about prior drug use, and the driver had not disclosed uh, prior his history with drug use and uh, other violations. Is that correct? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, there is a spot on that form to uh, indicate if you'd used illicit drugs. Uh, amongst other things, and the driver uh, indicated he had not. And if you if you have a record, which clearly he had a record of violations involving drug use, 
do the medical examiners not have access and should they have access to be able to independently verify that rather than just rely on somebody's honesty? So I'll take that one if that's okay. Um, the, um, the, in, in all of our transportation uh, certification, medical certifications, we rely on the individual to not perjure themselves and tell the truth. Um, in this case, it probably would have prevented him from getting a, a, a medical certificate. Um, so there's lots of incentive for drivers to omit details. Um, the, the certified medical examiner has no access to the driver's driving history. They have whatever access to the medical history they are given by the driver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can, if they, if they have a question, they can ask for additional information from the person's primary caregiver. But this was a young, otherwise healthy gentleman. I would doubt that there would be any reason to, to do that. Okay. I have additional questions on this. I'll circle back because I'm out of time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Member Hamadi and Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to circle back to the uh, new entrant program. So, Mr. Fox, I have a couple questions for you on that uh, again. Um, when Westfield went through the FMCSA's 18-month new entrant program from July 2016 to January 2018, how many trucks and trailers was Westfield operating? Uh, between one and two. One and two, okay. And it was, am I correct that neither combination vehicle required a CDL to operate at that time? At that time, they were using a non-CDL required vehicle combination. Okay. At the time of the crash, how many combination vehicles did Westfield operate? Uh, they had eight and two of them required CDL. Okay, so we had two, they needed, they had two with uh, required CDL. Um, now, initially, Westfield, when they went through their new entrant program, they did not require any CDLs. So, um, did uh, were there additional requirements that Westfield had to to do after they uh, acquired vehicles that required a CDL? Are there additional requirements from FMCSA? No, sir. Right with the CDL. No, sir. They they have to uh, remain compliant uh, for roadside inspections and uh, successfully pass the new entrant program, a uh, new entrant safety audit, which they did. As a matter of fact, they had zero violations on their safety audit, and uh, they successfully completed the program. And basically, were flying underneath the radar, uh, not detecting, not being detected by FMCSA. It was after they exited the new entrant program that they started to ramp their operations up. Okay. If I may add real quickly, yeah. uh, they were required uh, to put a drug and alcohol program in once they started using CDLs. Um, so there were certain requirements that they net needed to meet after starting using the new vehicles. Thank you, because that was going to be my question. I thought they were required to ramp up at least that, pro that part of the program. And I, as we know from the presentation, they did not have a, a drug and alcohol program. No, sir. Um, so when you ramp up an operation like that, is an operator required to do anything more for FMCSA? Does Do they inform FMCSA that they have uh, two vehicles that are greater than 26,000 pounds gross vehicle weight rating and that they're going to be ramping up their program with those no, additional requirements? There's no requirement for any of that. There's no additional audit that comes no. because of that? No, sir. Okay. So let me ask you, what is your what is the staff's opinion on that? Do they feel that there should be an additional audit or some kind of notification to let FC, FMCSA know that they're ramping up their program? Well, staff believes that uh, uh, there should be an extra layer of oversight to uh, recently graduated new entrant. Uh, carriers, and that's why staff is proposing a recommendation in that issue area. Great, great, and I agree with that. That I, I, I think that needs to be highlighted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fox. I appreciate that. I'm going to switch over to uh, motorcycle safety now. I got a couple questions on that, and I want to thank the staff for making such a, a very good presentation about uh, the impairment of motorcycle drivers and motorcycle riders and the uh, statistics that are out there. 
and also the helmet loss statistics. Uh, I think that's very important for my uh, rider friends out there to be aware of. I do have a question about uh, spacing for riders in formation. And um, what is the safety purpose? What What is the, the purpose of riding in formation? What's the safety purpose behind that? Uh, it's it's basically to increase uh, the formation's visibility to oncoming traffic so that you have uh, motorcycles on both sides of the lane of travel so that uh, oncoming vehicles can and drivers can see it. Okay. Um, how many motorcyclists were riding in formation in, in this crash? How many do we have motorcycles? I believe it was 15 altogether. 15. Okay. Um, what is the recommended number of riders in formation? What's that number? Do we know? I do not know that. Okay. Um, I went out to the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, and as of December 2018, they recommend the number of riders should stay to a maximum of five to seven riders for safety. So we had twice that number, basically. Yes. So that, I, I want to I highlight that for our rider friends out there. Um, and it also states that larger groups can easily bunch up on the road and become an obstacle unto themselves. Quote out of the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. Um, when riding in the formation, where in the lane should the lead motorcyclist be positioned? They, they should stay on the uh, left side of the lane of travel, but uh, far enough off the center line to, to be safe. Okay. Yeah, I, and, I, and the side also it says that the uh, lead should be in the left third of the lane and then the, the alternating rider should be in the right third of the lane. And my concern there is I saw nothing on the website that said how close or, or how far off the center line they should be. And I believe uh, during the presentation today, where was the lead rider as, uh, as compared to the center line? Uh, our reconstruction indicated that he was very, very close to the center line. Yeah, and and that concerns me. I I I would hope our rider friends out there understand that being close that close to the lane uh, reduces reaction time. Obviously, uh, it makes me nervous. I passed a lot of motorcycles. I've had motorcycles pass me, um, and when they're close to that lane, it makes me very nervous, and it it reduces their reaction time and distance. So, that's important. Um, I think I would love to see the uh, Motorcycle Safety Foundation come out with a different uh, uh, or a, a guidance as far as staying off the center line. And uh, I see my time up, is up, so uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, sir, Member Graham, thank you very much. And Member Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna follow up uh, on some of uh, Member Graham's questions. Um, again, with respect to Westfield, when it exited the new entrant program, uh, it acquired two vehicles with weights exceeding 26,000 pounds. That should have triggered the drug testing program required by existing regulation. But the point here is not limited to the fact that they had recently exited the new entrant program. This could be any operator that changes its profile at some point in time. Uh, wouldn't have to be shortly after enter, uh, exiting the new entrant program. It could be after an operator had been in business for five, 10 years, correct? That's correct, sir. So the problem, I think, um, and, and and Member Graham was, was certainly getting at this and did a good job of highlighting is when the company added these two larger vehicles, there was apparently no means by which that information was communicated, or at least automatically communicated, to FMCSA, correct? That is correct. So the agency in this case, and frankly in, in any case where an operator's profile has changed, there, there's, no, there's no clear means for FMCSA to be made aware that an operational profile has changed. Now, every couple of years, a motor carrier does have to update their MCS-150, and there is some uh, uh, specifics in there, maybe on fleet size and uh, drivers. But unless FMCSA does an on-site inspection or, or compliance review, they really don't know 
the complexion of the company, you know, how many vehicles they have, what type of equipment that, that they have, they're operating, if they're CDL or non-CDL. But even in filing the paperwork, it would require someone at FMCSA to sit down and evaluate that paperwork and kind of connect the dots to to understand that the profile had changed in such a way that it might trigger other requirements, such as a drug testing program. That is correct. Is there, um, I, I'm guessing the answer to this is no, but uh, would an insurance company communicate a change to FMCSA when new ve vehicles are added to a policy? No, sir. <clears throat> so this is something, certainly I think, I imagine you would agree, FMCSA should look at some procedural improvements to ensure that there's a, a a better means of being made aware of the agency being made aware when an operator's profile is changed, triggering drug testing requirements, um, CDL requirements, whatever whatever other um, uh, issues might um, might go along with a with a profile change. Yes, sir, you're correct. Uh, Member Chapman, if I may Fine. just add yes. very quickly, uh, the, we fully agree that there are a number of deficiencies that FMCSA could could address, and what you and Member Graham have just described are one of them, and that is clearly one where Westfield Transport has failed. In case of Westfield Transport and the circumstances that led to this crash, uh, we believe that the carrier uh, essentially played the system, meaning that they laid low and uh, operated with only a single vehicle uh, flying under the radar until they exited the new entrant program, which allowed them to enter the uh, the time of the standard oversight, meaning that the uh, bar for the that uh, was uh, required for a CR for compliance review is much lower. So they waited until they completed the new entrant, the new entrant program to ramp up the operation. So what we've identified is a particular uh, duration in the lifetime of a carrier that may be problematic uh, that uh, FMCSA should take a particular uh, 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 look at for additional uh, oversight. Uh, at the same time, we fully uh, would support FMCSA conducting uh, more broader uh, oversight regarding other issues. Uh, I understand. And certainly I, I see that the, the risk here is more prevalent, particularly the risk of abuse is more prevalent in this scenario where you have a relatively new carrier uh, leaving the new entrant program and then and then potentially gaming the system. But it, it, it appears the way the system is currently structured that this sort of scenario could arise even innocently uh, by an operator that maybe is not as up to speed on the requirements as uh, as perhaps they should be. Um, expanding an operation or changing the profile in some way uh, might, might even innocently trigger these requirements and not be aware of it. That is correct, sir. A company could start off with non-CDL equipment, as you say, and then realize they need uh, uh, bigger uh, vehicles to carry their larger loads and they increase staff. And as you say, they could enter into uh, drug testing requirements. So it could be very innocent. It could just be the demand of the business. Thank you. Th and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, uh, another series of questions I'd like to ask. I'll hold those for the next round. Absolutely. We'll plan uh, certainly uh, another round or two. So thank you, Member Chapman. Mr. Bergonia, I want to see if I can get clarification of something that you said in response to Member Graham. I believe you said that the lead motorcyclist uh, was, quote unquote, close to the center line. Um, it's my understanding from page 57 that investigators believe that actually a portion of the fairing of his motorcycle was actually likely extending over the center line. Is, is my understanding of that correct? I believe that that was the uh, analysis that uh, they came up with, yes. So who, who on the staff can tell me how we came up with that analysis? That, that would be that reconstructionist Bob, Bob Squire. That would, that would be me. Uh, what we were presented with was the physical evidence of the impact itself. And the, the physical evidence being 
the uh, tire mark atop the center line, which was attributed to the pickup truck. Uh, in order for that contact to occur, uh, then the motorcycle would have to overhang the center line at that point. But what we don't have is a lot of information uh, from the vehicles as they're coming into uh, just immediately before contact. Uh, but based on the uh, physical evidence at contact or at maximum engagement, the motorcycle has to overhang the, the, the center line, uh, the, the fairing portion, which would also encompass the end of the handlebars. Okay, so we do believe that the tire, the tires were in the proper lane. However, uh, the handlebars and the fairing were more than likely, according to your analysis, it, uh, protruding into the oncoming, onco oncoming lane. Now, uh, is it legal, unless you have a permit and being being accompanied by uh, an escort vehicle, is it legal to allow any portion of a vehicle to extend over the uh, the center line? No, the, my knowledge would be only if there was a hazard that would require you to cross the center line to avoid the hazard. Yes, and we don't know of any hazard that would have uh, uh, um, required that to happen in this particular case. However, I do want to point out that the, the staff believes, and I want to hear you say it, what do you believe, what weight do you believe this has in the accident causation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, with regard to the the putting that in the probable cause. Um, we don't know, you know, one, as Bob Squire mentioned, how long the vehicle was in that position. Uh, we, we certainly know with the pickup truck, there were many cases of him crossing over out of his lane that he needed. Um, but without knowing really how long, he might have just momentarily gotten into it. We don't think it rises to the probable cause. Okay, thank you. And uh, Member Chairman, if I may, uh, add uh, the while well, staff fully agrees that uh, uh, riding impaired and the lead rider has a high BAC and that close to the center line are certainly not good representations of safe riding at all. But the it was the uh, pickup truck, the combination vehicle that encroached into the oncoming lane. So without that encroachment, the crash would not have uh, occurred. So that is where staff has, is making the distinction. Yeah, thank you. And and I want to put a fine point on that, uh, Dr. Bechik. Uh, I mean, not only is it an unsafe practice to drive impaired, but it is illegal. It's a crime to drive impaired, and it is also not proper to have a portion of your vehicle uh, extending into the other lane. However, I do want to make a point that we're not blaming the victim. And uh, uh, I'm certainly not going to go there, but I still am not going to condone having a BAC of 0.135 when we know from our studies that a BAC, really anything over about 0 0.02 begins to have an impairing effect, and uh, 0 0.08 is the per se legal limit in most states with the exception of of, of, of um, Utah. So anyway, um, I didn't even really get to the questions I wanted, but my time is up. So we will uh, uh, get those questions in the next round. And Vice Chairman Landsberg, you are recognized, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So it was a bit of a surprise to me to learn that you need a commercial driver's license, except when you don't. And that is when you are uh, operating a vehicle of less than 26,000 pounds. And in this case, if I understand correctly, the driver did not require a CDL and some of the things that go along with that. And yet the company, once they crossed over the 26,000 pound level, was required to meet a higher level of uh, uh, standard. Am I understanding this correct with the drug tests and, and some of the other things that are, re are then required? So weight and seating capacity and hazardous materials dictate the uh, requirement for CDL. 
In this particular case, the combination unit the driver was operating at the time of the crash did not require a CDL, but the driver did have a CDL. That was his license. So uh, the other vehicles that Westfield had in their uh, fleet did require a CDL, and it's plausible and probable that uh, the accident driver would eventually be operating one of those CDL required pieces of equipment. And so how would FMCSA know about that? They would not, sir. This is, you know, the more we look into this, the more their regulations look an awful lot like Swiss cheese. Um, on the driver's history, um, so I think we would agree that the state should have revoked this driver's CDL prior to the crash. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I'll let Mr. Collins add to the conversation. Uh, yes is a uh, perfect answer there, and we, and we uh, plainly state so in our presentation and in the report. Should, after the crash in Texas, which happened not long before, should his CDL have been at least suspended or something as a result of that? M Mr. Fox is, is more familiar with the rules on maintaining your CDL than I am, uh, but I will say the, the rollover crash of the car carrier in Texas, uh, the driver was not cited. Um, so that uh, there's there's some degrees there as well, um, but I will defer any specific questions to to maintaining the CDL to Mr. Fox. Yeah. So after the uh, Texas crash, uh, he was not cited for that uh, violation, and uh, he was not subject to any suspension or revocation. He okay. was for his uh, his uh, offense in uh, Connecticut. Did he have anything other, bes uh, I'm trying to remember, did he have anything besides what happened in Connecticut that would have put his uh, CDL in jeopardy? No, sir. Okay. You know, we've, on the aviation side of things, which is where my background is, uh, we've made a, a pretty big deal out of being able to, to track bad actors uh, to, to deal with them through the Pilot Records Improvement Act and, and some of those kinds of things. Isn't there something similar on the highway side, the National Driver Registry? Uh, that, that database does not uh, capture the data like it is in the pilot notification system. It seems like it, at some point, and maybe not appropriate for this immediate conversation, but looking downstream, uh, for commercial operators, it might make sense to have something like this because this individual quite clearly didn't want to say, hey, I've got this drug issue and, and I've had a number of crashes and so on because he wouldn't likely get hired, although we, we can't say that for certainty. Uh, but there ought to be a way for um, uh, various companies to be able to ascertain, is this person a good driver or not? Well, to their credit, the FMCSA does have uh, the alcohol and uh, drug clearinghouse, which does uh, retain records of drivers who tested positive for drug tests. So a, a uh, motor carrier that is doing due diligence will query that system to see if, it, if the driver that they're trying to hire uh, has not tested positive for a controlled substance. Okay, was this guy in that system? He was not in that system. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, well that, that sounds to me like there might be sort of a procedure here, but we we don't really know, and, and I think that's something we ought to look at. Uh, thank you, Mr. No, Chairman. Vice Chairman, if I may add to, um, you write the drug and alcohol clearinghouse is one tool. Another is the um, pre-employment screening program that the FMCSA has that employers can have drivers um, and, and check that for histories for drivers. Uh, and then the, the NDR and then SIDLIS or other sources. But the pre-employment screening program that FMCSA has we've supported, which allows employers to look for histories. Okay, thank you very much. Vice Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Member Homedy. Thanks very much. And I have questions for Mr. Brigonier. 
I, I believe you're doing analog braking systems, right? Yes, analog brakes. OK, great. So the model years of the 13 motorcycles discussed in the report range from 1998 to 2019, and four of them were equipped with ABS. Uh, the NTSB held a motorcycle safety forum in 2006 where Harley Davidson, BMW, and Honda had participated. And in fact, BMW had, and I have a copy of it, talked about all the benefits of ABS. Um, and that was about the time where we started talking about ABS with respect to motorcycles. And I do want to congratulate Harley Davidson because they have an excellent four part video on their website, which talks in detail about the benefits of ABS and uh, shows how, how the system works. Um, so I have a motorcycle license and I recently visited a Harley Davidson dealership. I like their street bikes, um, but their street bikes, the ABS is an option. Now, granted it's about $798 additional but it's optional. Other models like their cruisers and their touring bikes, it's included. Um, it's standard equipment. We have recommendations for, uh, well, I'll let, I'll let you talk about what our recommendation is on ABS for motorcycles. Yeah, so in, in 2018, uh, the NTSB held a motorcycle safety uh, uh, seminar and uh, part of that, Part of the results from that came out that we made a recommendation to NHTSA that said that basically we would like to have a new regulation requiring all new motorcycles be equipped with ABS uh, for the road motorcycles be equipped with ABS and that uh, recommendation is is uh, unacceptable response at this point and that's why we're trying to reiterate that um, today. And um, IHS had done a report uh, a little while back that said, um, you know, for older, older mo motorcycles that are on the road now, only about 5% have ABS. I don't know if that's still the case. Do you happen to know for the newer motorcycles what that percentage is right now? I know it's not required. I know NHTSA um, hasn't... Uh, 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 addressed our recommendation, but do you happen to know what the manufacturers have done? So uh, we believe that the, some of the manufacturers are stepping up to the plate on this. Um, as of 2019, approximately 60% of newly manufactured road motorcycles uh, are uh, equipped standard with ABS, which is uh, important because as you just pointed out, the the, if it's a $800 option, a lot of people aren't going to go for that. So we believe it, it should be standard. And actually, that's why we're we're recommending to NHTSA that they actually make it mandatory. Well, and, and actually, a lot of people don't know it's an option and are not told it's an option. Um, I had to research it a little bit further to see what the options were on the motorcycles that I was looking at. Um, and they were additional so but but what is so we have a recommendation all new motorcycles should have abs what's the standard in the european union uh, in the european union they are all required to uh have abs 100 percent standard 100 percent standard yes and what's the benefit of abs just really quickly it uh, it keeps you able to control your uh, motorcycle come to a, a controlled stop rather than skidding. Um, so and you don't have rear wheel, rear wheel locks or front yeah, yeah. wheel locks. Exactly. As long as your wheels are rotating, you have control of the motorcycle, generally speaking. Okay. So it could help come to a, brit a pretty abrupt stop while keeping the motorcycle upright. Correct. And so, you know, and and there's that's definitely important, but what is the responsibility on the vehicle side? What sort of, and maybe this is for Dr. Malloy, what sort of crash prevention technologies has NTSB recommended and what are the status of those recommendations for vehicles so that they don't hit motorcycles? We, we did actually, uh 
make recommendations out of our motorcycle safety study, uh, looking at vehicle to vehicle technologies that would allow commu ve commu vehicles to communicate to one another. So if a vehicle is coming at you and you're about to take a left turn in front of it as a motorcycle, you would know that that's a risk. Um, we've also you know, called for other technologies to be better able to detect motorcycles. Uh, so both of those things uh, we've asked for. Um, and we asked that for NHTSA to be standard and uh, Julie Pro may have the status of those recommendations. I don't have them in front of me. Okay. Um, and she's not, is she on here or no? Um, oh, you, can, you can provide that at a later time. Yeah. My, uh, my time's up. So I do have, Mr. Chairman, I do have additional questions for uh, other rounds. Great, and thank you, uh, Member Hamidi. And to make sure that we get the information for the next round, what specifically was the question that you had? Was it uh, something for uh, Ms. Perot? Uh, I just wanted to know the status of the recommendations on uh, collision avoidance technologies for vehicles to prevent them from coming in contact with motorcycles. I just want to know the status of those recommendations. Great, thank you. And I'll yeah, look them up and have them for you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, and uh, Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a couple of questions about uh, driver qualification file, and specifically, what information is required in the in a driver qualification file? In a driver qualification file, a uh, motor carrier must obtain a um, application. They have to do a uh, background check on the driver. They have to. Uh, ascertain or uh, query the driver's uh, license information or CDL information. They also have to obtain uh, any accident information. Additionally, they will also need to, re uh, are required to um, find out if the driver was required to have drug and alcohol testing in his previous employment and uh, find out what the results of those tests were. Okay, thank you. So what, what was missing in this driver's uh, driver qualification file? Uh, basically everything. <laughs> they had a copy of the driver's MVR report, and I believe they had a cop a photograph of the driver's CDL. CDL, okay. Uh, what information about the driver would have been uncovered if Westfield had performed the investigation and inquiries uh, check? Well, if they uh, contacted the previous uh, motor carrier the driver worked for, which was FBI Express, they would have learned that the driver had a rollover crash just days before he started employment at Westfield. And uh, if he had, if they went a step further and contacted the previous motor carrier, uh, Universe Express, they would have learned that the driver was terminated for acting strangely. Okay. Um do most carriers complete this kind of request before they employ somebody? Absolutely. All safe, uh, well-intentioned motor carriers will, uh, at a minimum, at a minimum, they will uh, find out everything they can on the last employee that the driver had and ascertain all those records. And they are required to produce those uh, documents to the uh, requesting motor carrier. And most or all motor carriers will do a, a thorough uh, background check. They even have third party services that will do this for them so that they have a very uh, clear picture of the driver's uh, safety performance, drug testing performance, and accident uh, history. Okay. At, at the time of the crash, had Westfield pulled the driver's RMV record? They had a copy of the driver's RMV report, yes. When did they pull that? They pulled it the day of the crash. The day of the crash. As a matter of fact, they pulled it in the docket. They pulled it at 7.38 p.m. the day of the crash. And what time did the crash happen at? Um, 6, 6.26 p.m. Yes, sir. So they pulled it after the, after the crash. Yes, sir. And why, why did they do that? Because they needed to add the driver to their policy, the insurance policy. Up until this point, the driver had been 
operating for the company or for the carrier uninsured. Exactly. As a matter of fact, we have an email in the docket at uh, 7.49 p.m. An email sent off to their broker basically says, I quote, please add this driver to our policy ASAP. So they, Westfield Transport, did not review the driving record before putting the driver on the road. Westfield only pulled the driving record after the crash when faced with legal liability of a catastrophic crash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fox. And I see my time's about up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have questions for one more round. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Mem Member Graham and Member Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is my last question. Uh, I want to discuss the probable cause, and I'll start by assuring the staff I'm really not trying to ambush you here. I, um, I, I anticipate there may be some deliberation about this issue uh, later on today, and I just want to give you an opportunity to um, share your thinking. The draft probable cause we'll consider today provides that impairment is the likely reason the pickup truck driver crossed the center line. And I have a question about the use of likely as a qualifier. Um, two previous and fairly recent investigations involving multiple substance impairment resulted in probable cause findings similar to what we'll consider today. However, neither invoked the qualifier likely, and both were more definitive in describing the connection between impairment and the crash circumstances. The two previous crashes I'm referring to occurred, one incurred in 2016, the other in 2017, one in Concan, Texas, I believe it's pronounced, and the other in Cooper Township, Michigan. Um, in the Texas crash, the probable cause the board found was the failure of the pickup truck driver to control his ve vehicle due to, Im due to impairment stemming from his use of marijuana in combination with misuse of a prescribed medication. In the Michigan accident, the probable cause the board found was the impairing effects of the driver's polysubstance abuse in the hours before the crash. Again, neither qualifies that in any way. Can you please provide additional background to help us understand the distinction between those two investigations and this one in terms of uh, qualifying the impact of impairment on the circumstances of the accident? Uh, certainly, Member Chapman. Uh, you're correct in both of those, we, we didn't qualify. Uh, in this crash, uh, we know the driver was impaired and we know impairment can cause uh, loss of control, you know, lane status. Uh, so those are linked. Uh, we were unable to completely rule out fatigue as a factor. Um, and so we don't have a video or anything to tell us exactly his behavior at the time. Um, but because we had another possible alternative we couldn't rule out, uh, in this case, the fatigue from sleeping in the uh, cab of the, of the truck, and then also a very short night, two nights, three nights before, um, we went with the term likely. Um, and, and the difference is, in this case, we have another that we couldn't completely rule out that we had some evidence for, and that's why we said likely. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, that's my last question, and I appreciate the work of the staff on this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Member Chapman. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sean Dalton, if you can look up the probable cause for the Davis, Oklahoma crash and see how we describe that one, because the term likely, I think we'll be hearing more. I think it's likely we'll be hearing more about that term likely um, as we did in our last board meeting. Um, so yeah, Sean, if you can look that up for Davis and just uh, shoot me an email. Um, yeah, so to the to the topic here, let me get my clock started. Um, Mr. Collins, on page 22 of the draft report, table three, it talks about uh, in, in June of 2014, the driver had his driver's license suspended in Ohio. However, Massachusetts did not learn about it until two and a half years later uh, in December of 2016. Why was there a delay in that particular case? I realize we've made a pretty big deal about uh, about it not being uh, from the May the 11th crash, Connecticut, or not crash, but conviction, arrest, I should say, 
and how that didn't make it to Massachusetts in time for this crash. What was the deal behind the uh, Ohio and the two and a half year delay there? Uh, ultimately, sir, I uh, was not able to determine specifically why that delay uh, occurred uh, because I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, the reporting mechanisms Ohio uses. Uh, however, uh, it is uh, entirely possible that had they sent a paper notice, you know, it, it would have been caught up in that uh, processing quagmire. Um, but what we do believe happened is that uh, Massachusetts had occasion for for some reason to check the NDR, the National Driver Register, and found the pointer for Ohio, and then followed up on it, and and therefore became aware of it. Um, but the initial reason uh, was not able to definitively determine. Suspect it has to do with the notification issue. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah. I mean, the, dig the deeper we dig into this thing, the more problems we see. And we find that not only was uh, the Massachusetts RMV not processing out-of-state violations, but they also weren't alerting other states when drivers from those states had their driver's license suspension suspended in Massachusetts. Uh, so it worked both ways. And furthermore, as, as your presentations have pointed out, this was not just a Massachusetts issue. We found problems with Rhode Island and New Hampshire, and I suspect that it's not just limited to New England. This is a systemic issues, and I think we have recommendations, and I'd like for you to tell me what the recommendations are that staff is proposing to help eliminate this systemic apparent nationwide problem that may be in place. Yes, sir, you're correct. Uh, staff absolutely believes uh, this is a problem that does need to be looked at nationwide. Uh, we are aware of other jurisdictions that, that simply don't bother or, or don't choose, uh, is a better word perhaps, to notify other states uh, if, if a driver licensed in that other state commits a violation in their jurisdiction. So staff is proposing recommendations uh, and, and the thrust is basically to have all of the jurisdictions uh, that license drivers in the United States re-examine their processes uh, to make sure to make sure they have effective ones or create them if necessary to handle both the processing of incoming out-of-state notifications as well as to send their own notifications to other jurisdictions. Very good, thank you, and I fully intend to support that that recommendation. Um, so at the end of the day, after it was all said and done, after all the checking and the rechecking, how many driver's licenses did the did the Massachusetts RMV end up ultimately suspending at the end of the day? I, I would I would have to look up the specific number, uh, but I do believe uh, I do know it was north of five thousand, and I believe it was slightly north of fifty two hundred drivers. Yep. Exactly. And, and, and here's a quote out of, out of the report. By failing to process the information about the infractions by Massachusetts licensed drivers in other states, the RMV deprived itself of information necessary to identify particularly unsafe drivers. In the 35 seconds that I've got left, I want to talk about an irony. I, I, here, here's a sad irony. I watched a documentary on, on the uh, Jarhead's website. It was uh, the Boston Globe did a documentary about this crash and one in Wisconsin. And one of the survivors of this Randolph crash, one who was severely injured, has had over 20 surgeries on the leg that was injured in this crash. So he, 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 he went to get a handicap sticker for his car because Obviously, if you've got a, a, a leg that's been uh, hurt severely, um, you would like to park closer to the store or whatever it is that you're going to. So he applies to get a handicap placard to hang on his mirror. And the RMV said, well, because of his injuries, he would have to take a pass a competency exam to see if he was fit to drive. And until he passed his driver's, until he passed that competency exam, he would have his driver's license suspended. And he had 30 days to respond. Now, there's an irony right there. 
that the organization that dropped the ball on the on the driver who almost killed him and did kill seven of his colleagues, the RMV that dropped the ball is now telling him he's got to complete a competency exam and until then his driver's license is suspended. That's a sad irony right there. So we'll go to the next round of questions and Vice Chairman Landsberg. Not so much a question, uh, but just a, uh, a final statement here. Um, we were talking, I believe, Mr. Kaminsky, about the benefits of helmets. And how many states uh, have no helmet requirement? Uh, uh, we have 18 states in the District of Columbia that have the universal helmet use law. So I guess uh, I think we can subtract that uh, 32. But the ones that have absolutely no helmet requirement, I think there's. Oh, one. that's three. That's three. Illinois, Iowa, and New Hampshire. All right. And I noticed that the states that have mandatory helmet laws have a pretty high level of compliance. That's correct. There was a study done, and I forget exactly who did it, and that's my my error. But um, it was a reputable organization. Um, like the National Safety Council or something, or the American Medical Association that said the difference in the medical costs of a motorcycle rider wearing a helmet, $71,000, not insignificant, compared to those who were not wearing helmets was uh, over $300,000. Now, maybe that's jumbling the fruit bowl a little bit, but I suspect that head injuries are a significant part of that. So. I would say that uh, people need to really take that into account. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions at this time, and um, I will uh, uh, have some uh, possible amendment to the probable cause when the time is uh, appropriate. Thank you. Vice Chairman, thank you. Are you saying it's likely that you'll have an amendment to the probable cause? Uh, I think there is that possibility. I think the word is likely. So anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Member Homedy. Thank uh, you very much. Um, I'm, if I may, Member Hamidi, real quickly, uh, both of the recommendations, H1829 and H1830 on V to V and uh, using motorcycles and passenger detection systems uh, in passenger vehicles are open, acceptable response from NHTSA. But they haven't taken ac action really on those. Right. Okay, great. Um, a couple of, of things, let me back up a second. The purpose of, of why we do these um, board meetings is not just to talk about what we found in the investigation, but our role at the NTSB is to prevent another similar crash from happening again. And um, a, a couple of, of questions I have about how that something could happen again, unfortunately. I want to, one, come back to uh, what the chairman was asking about with uh, the compact. Um, it's possible that's Mr. Collins, I'm not sure. So states have this non-resident violator compact that AMVA maintains, is that correct? Who can answer that? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, there, there are uh, two compacts, the uh, driver licensing compact and the non-resident violator compact. Correct. And in this situation, this was a non-resident violator compact exchange from Connecticut to Massachusetts. Um, actually, uh, I, I do not believe that Massachusetts has signed on to the non-resident violator compact. Uh, they did, actually, in December of 1987. They are not a member of the driver license compact. Uh, that's where my confusion stems from. No. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, that's okay. Uh, the, re the reason, and that wasn't a got you on, on you, the reason I'm concerned is, is you know, you had this situation where, where Connecticut rightfully sent Massachusetts a, no a couple of notifications that there was a problem with this driver, the driver's license was suspended in the state, uh, Massachusetts didn't take action, both Connecticut and Massachusetts are part of this non-resident violator compact. But what happens 
with the seven states that are not part of the compact. So in and I, you know, for my list, that's Alaska. Well, let's just take California, Michigan, Montana, Oregon, Virginia, which for some reason dropped out of that in 2019, and Wisconsin. Uh, the the individual states can choose, uh, of course, to belong to the compact. They can also choose or enact legislation uh, to require them to to report the the moving offenses or the violations by by out-of-state drivers uh, to those other jurisdictions, uh, and some choose not to report such violations. Uh, the mm -hmm. matter is is left up to the, the governing bodies of the individual states. So we have seven states that are not part of this interstate compact. There are other states that are not part of the driver license compact, but we want the states to process incoming notifications and states to send notifications to other states about violations. But we have seven states that are not a member. And so I guess what this leads me to ask, do we have a recommendation on recommending the states that are not within the non-resident violator compact to join the compact? That uh, was definitely something that was considered in the report development process. Um, as we did our research and spoke with AMVA and uh, a couple of the states, uh, it became clear that there are issues associated belonging to the compact um, that some states simply don't want to address. So uh, ultimately what, what staff came down to was simply requesting the states themselves, rather than join a particular compact or a, a particular system, look at their processes and develop effective ones to handle those notifications. If that involves being a member of the compact, uh, that would certainly meet uh, staff's anticipated goal for the, for the recommendation. Uh, if a state chose, chooses not to join the compact, but develops its own robust system to handle notifications from other states and to send their own, uh, that would also meet the intent of the recommendation. Okay, great. And one other, and I'm going to switch topics for a second. Uh, this might be uh, Mike Fox, uh, Mr. Fox. Um, reincarnated carriers. Um, what prevents the owner of Westfield or say his brother in this case, from just forming a new carrier in the future? Uh, currently nothing. Nothing. That's because FMCSA says there's no prohibition against operating more than one motor carrier or just operating another motor carrier. What could have prevented them from forming another carrier? Uh, Staff believes the imminent hazard order would stop uh, reincarnation. And just, and I know I'm out of time, but just following up that with that, with one more, uh, one more question, FMCSA, we sought clarification on that and F on, on why they didn't issue an imminent hazard order. And FMCSA said, that none of the violations discovered by them in the compliance review impacted the June 21st, 2019 crash. Do you agree with that and why or why not? Staff disagrees with that. Clearly the actions uh, taken by the carrier, the lack of oversight by the motor carrier directly impacted the crash because they allowed the driver to be behind the wheel at the time of the crash. And I guess that's my concern. There were several areas, several times where um, uh, actions could have been taken, whether it was by, you know, Westfield themselves, whether it was from other entities, whether it was and 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 FMCSA. And in this case, Westfield can just become a new carrier because essentially FMCSA let them. Yes, ma'am. And that's the problem. Thank you very much. I do. I have. Some questions about the vice chairman's likely, uh, which I could do in a, a next round or when he gets to his likely amendment. Well, thanks. I would uh, propose that we discuss that once the amendment comes up, if in fact it does. Um, that would be my suggestion. Um, so thank you, um, Member Hamidi and Member Graham. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm probably going to go down that likely road here a bit right now. Um, during the presentation, the team said that the crash driver stated he deviated from the lane because he was reaching for a drink. Is this explanation consistent with the witness reports? Uh, no, uh, no, sir. Uh, uh, staff does not believe so. Um, that would be a, a, a one time or, or a short time sort of loss of control, if you were, uh, or, or poor control. Um, while it is possible to deviate your lane while reaching for something inside the vehicle, it, it wouldn't explain even the deviation a minute before. It certainly wouldn't explain his behaviors uh, as he left his last delivery or the other reports between the two or even the reports earlier in the day. Um, so, so staff believes that, that his offered explanation isn't consistent with that prior behavior. It's not consistent. So the swerving and the previous deviations from the lanes, what what does staff believe that indicates? Uh, I, after uh, my analysis, uh, I believe that 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 behavior is is most likely associated with his substance multiple substance use impairment or the impairment resulting from his multiple substance use. OK, thank you. So the the, the driver disclosed details about his history of drug use uh, to the responding officer of the crash and they were and I, I, I've got them right here told him he used three to ten bags of heroin a day, drank energy drinks and ate chocolate to help with the effects of drugs, used illicit drugs the night before the crash about 9 to 10 p.m., used two bags of heroin and 0.5 grams of cocaine on the morning of the crash about 8 a.m., could feel the effects of cocaine after leaving his last delivery, and that was 17 minutes before the collision, was not crashing from the drug, was not crashing from the drug use at the time of the collision, but would have started to crash soon. So about two to three hours after the crash, the driver submitted to having a blood sample taken for drug testing. The yes. crash driver tested positive for six different drugs, including fentanyl and morphine. So this is a question for our medical doctor. Based on the history of deviating from the lane and the levels of substance identified in the post-crash blood test, is there any doubt that the driver was impaired at the time of the crash? I can't tell you if he was going up or coming down, but I can tell you he was impaired based on his behavior. So he now, was impaired. I think he was impaired, unfortunately, both with uh, uh, opiates, and he was using two of them. Most likely the morphine is a um, metabolite of the heroin he was intending to use. Heroin doesn't last long in your system, so it's not surprising it was gone long before they drew his blood. The, uh, the problem is that you have many effects right after you use these drugs, and then you have a bunch more effects as you are coming down off of them. I think his ability to tell and describe what he was feeling is unlikely to be correct. Um, and uh, and how much of this was affected by his fatigue, how much of his fatigue was because he keeps getting high and coming back down, we just couldn't figure out. How is, how is the person's performance degraded from all these drugs? Well, he's on a mix of uppers and downers. So at any given moment, it's difficult to say exactly what his behavior is going to be like. The opioids are going to make somebody high and sleepy and not interested in working. But if you mix that with cocaine, it counteracts some of the sleepy effects. So it's very difficult to tell at any given point in time exactly what he would have been feeling. And I don't think he's a reliable witness. I would agree with that. Um, would he be in what would happen just with all those drugs in the system would just doing a minor task like actually reaching for a drink in a cup holder would that affect the driver it's difficult to say i mean he's clearly he spent the day driving sometimes he had a vehicle on the trailer sometimes he didn't he's managed to get around without crashing up until this point um where although his behavior is witnessed as being erratic and crossing over the center line um so, you know, how much of that is made worse by reaching for a drink or a sandwich or whatever, I, it's impossible to say. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no more questions. 
Thank you very much. And I think uh, Member Chapman's indicated he doesn't have any any questions, but we can always certainly come back for questions if he would like. Um, so, so I'll jump in there. Um, Member Hamidi asked about, and, and others, other of my colleagues have jumped on this too, the nonsensical response of the FMCSA, the fact that none of the violations according to, to FEMSA, uh, uh, FMCSA, uh, uh, the fact that none of them were discovered uh, um, impacted the crash according to FMCSA, that, that in itself is nonsensical because the, the issues that we found, all of those issues that I went through at the very beginning of my round of questioning back on round one, those should have indicated that this carrier, Westfield Transport, was was in fact an imminent hazard to safety. So, and, and then of course we've pointed out too, Mr. Fox, that that had FMCSA issued the imminent hazard, it would have mitigated the ability of those folks involved in Westfield tran Transport from going out and becoming reincarnated in some form or fashion. So, you know, not only did the Massachusetts RMV drop the ball. But, FEM, but FMCSA has missed the point as well. So I'm going to check that off my list. Um, let me move over now to the idea of motorcycle helmets. Uh, Mr. Kaminsky, the page 97 of the report mentions a figure that I found to be very interesting. It talked about a NHTSA study, and it, it says that if all motorcyclists in 2017 had worn a DOT-compliant helmet, nearly $9 billion, I think the actual figure was it said $8.9 billion, I think. So, so nearly $9 billion in comprehensive cost could have been saved in 2017. What, what does comprehensive cost what does that mean? Good question. Comprehensive costs include an evaluation of lost quality of life, as well as lost productivity, medical costs, legal and court costs, EMS service costs, insurance administrative costs, property damage, and workplace losses. So basically, that's, that's a, a cost to society. Is that basically correct? Yes, sir. Look, I understand the idea that we don't want an, a, a heavy-handed government. I, I understand that. And I think most people would agree with that. Where it, the, the, the issue is, where do we draw the line on what's heavy-handed? Some people might say, oh, that's, you know, you can't tell me to n not smoke in a restaurant. That's violating my, my f freedom of whatever. And some people might say, no, that definitely needs to happen because it's a health hazard. But I think that, that someone's right to freedom to ride without a helmet ends at my wallet. That's a cost that we all are paying. And I've, I've gone out and talked to people in the legislative uh, branches and they say, oh, I'm a libertarian. I don't want these laws. I think anybody ought to get out and ride a motorcycle without a helmet if that's what they cho so choose. And if they get in a crash and they die, well, then they lose their lives. But it's a lot more than that. Not only do they l lose their lives, but they leave behind family members. And there's a cost to society. So I don't buy this idea that we should be able to do whatever we want when it comes to motorcycle helmets. And unfortunately, states are not adding requirements for motorcycle helmets. In fact, they're going the other way. They are repealing these requirements. So I just wanted to make that point that we do have statistics that's already been pointed out. It's been pointed out twice that uh, states with the mandatory helmet laws have 90, 90, about 89% compliance with, with wearing helmets and those without or partial uh, helmet laws, it's down to 56%. So helmet laws do make a difference in terms of increasing compliance. And as the vice chairman pointed out, there's a huge difference in the cost um, right there between somewhere between about $70,000 and over $300,000 for a head injury. So uh, I think um, I'm out of time.
And I will leave on that. Yep, that's about it for me. So we'll go to the next round. Um, Vice Chairman, any questions for you, sir? No, sir. No further questions. Right. Member Hamadi, you're recognized. And let me just, uh, let's see how many folks. Uh, uh, Member Graham, do you have any any additional questions as well? Member Graham has no more questions. Okay. Uh, Member Hamadi, you are recognized for 10 minutes. Uh, well, I just have one question. Um, well, two questions. The the report on page 20, or my page 20, says there was no sign of hard braking or right word, right word steering by the combination vehicle before the first impact. So there was no braking at all. Is there anyone that can answer that? Um, Based on the address. I'm sorry, based on the reconstruction, no, we have no evidence of turn or braking. Okay, and um, leading up to the crash, how many witnesses reported seeing the vehicle moving erratically over, or just moving erratically? Certainly multiple witnesses. Uh, we have the, just before the crash, about a minute, You've got the, the firefighters who saw it uh, and were concerned about potentially getting hit and another, so multiple. I counted 13 witnesses that we interviewed. And are we talking just minutes before the crash or hours? We are, we are in, in the terms of those witnesses, we're talking uh, both. Uh, there's one that's a minute prior to the crash uh, there's uh, two witness statements from his prior drop off uh, and they continue. Uh, there are some in between those two points and they continue back into earlier in the day. OK, great. Um, OK, thanks very much. That's all the questions I have. Great. Thank you very much. Do uh, any of my colleagues have additional questions? Chairman, if I may interrupt, and before, uh, I'm assuming you, you want to discuss a uh, PC issue, and you mentioned no. uh, of Davis, Oklahoma earlier, and if I can just provide the factor uh, for board members. Uh, well, yeah, you're, you're welcome to do that, and uh, let's let's save that because uh, who knows, we might even might not even have an amendment. So I, I know we will, but let's just keep things in the order, and uh, so. But we, we do want to hear from staff on that. Um, no more questions from my colleagues. What I'll do is I do think it is likely that we will have a protracted uh, debate on the use of word the, the, likely. So um, I'd like to take a break here. Let's take a uh, oh, about a 12 minute break. We'll, we will reconvene at 1230 and we are in recess. And if everyone would please turn off, make sure your cameras are off and your microphones.
Okay, we are back in session. Do any of my colleagues have any further questions? Okay, seeing none at this time, I'll ask the uh, Deputy Managing Director for Investigations, Brian Curtis, to please read the proposed findings. Yes, sir. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 20 findings. Number one, none of the following were factors in the crash. One, driving experience of the pickup truck driver and motorcycle riders. Two, cell phone distraction by the pickup truck driver. Three, mechanical condition of the combination vehicle and the motorcycles. Four, highway design. And five, weather conditions. Number two, the emergency response to the crash was timely and appropriate. Number three, the pickup truck driver's crossing of the center line likely occurred because of his impairment from use of multiple drugs. Number four, due to systemic deficiencies in the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles, RMV, operations and inaction to rectify a known problem, the RMV failed to revoke the pickup truck driver's commercial driver's license, CDL, as well as the licenses of many non-CDL Massachusetts drivers with infractions or suspensions in other states. Number five, had the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles had effective systems in place to promptly revoke driver's licenses based on out-of-state notifications the pickup truck driver's license would have been revoked before the Randolph crash. Number six, post-crash system changes by the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles, RMV, represent progress towards addressing the substantial deficiencies in RMV operations that existed at the time of the crash. Number seven, if the post-crash system changes by the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles are maintained, they would reduce the likelihood of drivers with a history of impaired driving retaining a Massachusetts driver's license. Number eight, considering the problems uncovered in Massachusetts and neighboring states, the process for revoking the licenses of commercial driver's license, CDL, and non-CDL drivers with disqualifying offenses could be greatly enhanced by improving interstate communication, including promptly sending notifications to other states and expeditiously processing incoming out-of-state notifications. Number nine, by failing to conduct an appropriate background check and safety history on the pickup truck driver, Westfield Transport exhibited a substantial disregard for federal motor carrier safety regulations, resulting in hiring and employing a driver with significant safety risks. Number 10, Westfield Transport's egregious non-compliance with federal motor carrier safety regulations and its actions to conceal its deceptive practices indicate a motor carrier without a regard for safety. Number 11, although the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's new entrant safety assurance program functioned as designed and did not detect violations by Westfield Transport during the probationary period that merited an expedited action, the program, due to its inherent limitations, could not predict Westfield Transport's subsequent unsafe operation. Number 12, recent graduates of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's new entrant safety assurance program that exhibit a dramatic increase in roadside inspections and subsequent violations demonstrate that the safety of their operation has been compromised. Number 13, based on two recent National Transportation Safety Board investigations in which drivers were able to easily manipulate, keep trucking, logging devices to falsify hours of service, these devices do not appear to be in compliance with federal regulations. Number 14, by deciding not to issue an imminent hazard order against Westfield Transport, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration missed an opportunity to improve safety by preventing the carrier's owner, manager, and drivers from continuing their unsafe practices, possibly with the same vehicles, by reincarnating into other carriers. 
Number 15, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration inconsistently applies imminent hazard orders, which can be an effective tool for removing unsafe motor carriers from service and preventing owners, managers, and drivers from continuing their unsafe practices, frequently with the same vehicles by reincarnating into other carriers. Number 16, the anti-lock braking systems on four of the motorcycles likely aided those riders in performing emergency braking during the crash sequence. Number 17, because anti-lock braking systems can aid motorcycle riders when braking in emergency situations, broad deployment of, their te of the technology would reduce the crash risk for motorcycle riders. Number 18, although the effectiveness of helmet use in this crash for each motorcyclist could not be conclusively determined, U.S. Department of Transportation, USDOT, compliant helmets have been shown to provide the best protection for motorcyclists when a crash occurs, and state universal helmet use laws increase the use of USDOT compliant helmets in those states. Number 19, although the lead rider was impaired by alcohol, the extent to which his impairment impeded his ability to execute an evasive maneuver could not be determined. And number 20, Although alcohol impairment increases a motorcycle rider's response time to a potential hazard, the rapid progression of impacts in this crash, along with the tight spacing, made it unlikely for most riders behind the lead motorcycle to be able to avoid the oncoming pickup truck. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Curtis, thank you very much for reading those. And at this time, I'll invite my board members to uh, we'll do a roll call just to make sure that we're all ready to deliberate. Vice Chairman Landsberg. I'm ready to deliberate, sir. Very well, sir. And uh, Member Hamandy. I'm here as well. All righty. And Member Graham. Member Graham's ready to deliberate. All right, sir. And Member Chapman. I'm ready for deliberations, Mr. Chairman. Great, thanks. And I'm here too, and I'm ready to deliberate as well. And um, so, are, are there any proposed uh, amendments to the findings? Yes, sir, Mr. Graham. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, I think if we're going to go down the road of uh, a discussion about a um, amendment to the probable cause, I believe uh, I'd like to propose an amendment to finding number three at this time for the discussion. <laughs> All right, sir, you're recognized. Go right ahead. Yeah, I would propose uh, that we strike the word likely from finding number three to read the pickup truck driver's crossing of the center line occurred because of his impairment from use of multiple drugs. Okay. Um, is there a second? That's your motion. And uh, great, thanks. Is there a second? I'll second for the purposes of discussion, sir. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Member Graham and seconded by the Vice Chairman. So, uh, discussion. Member Graham, you're recognized. Yes, I think uh, from our uh, questioning with the doctor and everything, I think I specifically heard that this driver was impaired at the time of the crash. I think there's no doubt from that and from the drug test. So, uh, I, I think we need to state that as such. That he that the driver was definitely impaired. Um, I haven't heard any other the witness statements about his erratic driving for the whole day, to include one minute prior to the crash itself, uh, about him coming across the uh, center line. I think drives that point home. Uh, I know staff is concerned that there there might be an aspect of fatigue to this. Um, but I think I've also heard the doctor say our medical doctor say that is good likelihood that fatigue was caused by the amount of drugs this this driver was taking and the ups and downs of the the uppers and downers uh, that caused that so i think if we're going to try to go down the path uh in the probable cause of removing the likely i think we need to state finding three and and, and strikes likely okay thank you very much um, great points and um so uh, what discussion do we have amongst our uh, our colleagues if you would like to be recognized, uh, just. Uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Yeah, yes, sir. Mr. It, 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 it may well be appropriate to strike, strike the word likely, but I want to make sure that we understand why we're striking it. And I apologize. I have some very nice fellows doing some yard work outside my window here. So I apologize for the noise. Um, my understanding is that likely refers to the reason for him crossing the center line, not whether he was likely impaired. There doesn't seem to be any question that he was impaired. So the, what we have to decide is whether we want to we want to find that he crossed the center line because of the impairment or whether there might have been some other reason and that other reason apparently might might be fatigue. Very good. Thank you very much. Who else would like to uh, weigh in on that? Uh, Vice Chairman. I just note that um, uh, fatigue is not listed in any of the other findings. And uh, I certainly uh, support what uh, member Graham and, and uh, uh, the doctor is saying uh, concerning the fact that m much of the fatigue he had, uh, according to our sleep uh, um, charts, that he had something like eight hours of sleep or almost eight hours on two nights prior. Now, granted, it wasn't under the best of circumstances in the cab, but there was, was opportunity. And according to the doctor, uh, you will get uh, fatigue issues as a result of the drugs. So if the drugs are the driver, then it seems like that's sort of a derivative. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, and Member Hominy. I'm going to agree with Member Graham <clears throat> on this one. And I understand it's uh, the qualifier is on crossing the center line. But on this one, we had 13 witnesses who saw the driver operating erratically throughout the day. We had reports that came from members of the Littleton Fire Department who stated the combination vehicle traveled into the breakdown lane and nearly struck their fire truck. Employees of the Gorham dealership who stated the driver was operating erratically and nearly struck one of their employees. We know there were no uh, uh, evidence, there was no evidence of braking or counter steering, I would uh, believe that if you, if the sole factor is fatigue, you would take those uh, measures to avoid a collision. I think there's no disputing this person was impaired, significantly impaired, when he alone admitted to using three to 10 bags of, uh, I can't remember if it's heroin plus cocaine, plus fentanyl, and everything else in his system. So I, I agree with um, the proposed amendment. Okay, well, thanks, that, that's good to know. And, uh, you, you know, when it was presented to me yesterday by Sean Dalton that uh, this might come up, I, I said, well, the, um, there's a distinction. We're not, we're not disputing, as, as Member Chapman said, we're not disputing whether or not he was impaired. Nope, nope. I don't think anybody's disputing that. We're putting the word likely in front of whether or not that's why he crossed the center line. I, I would be, I would be content to uh, to go ahead with it. Uh, with with it is the way that uh, I'd be I'd be content at this point to support Member Graham's amendment before we drag it out. I mean, we can get input from staff, which we will do. But 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 I'd be interested in a straw poll uh, to see. Um, if anybody would oppose this amendment. Member Graham, I think you, or Member Chapman, I think you raise a really good point. Um, um, I mean, we can we can debate this all day long, uh, but let's just take a straw poll. If you if you would oppose this amendment, uh, show show your hand, signal with a hand. Okay, so it looks like nobody would oppose it. So I'd sure like to hear from uh, from staff to get your thoughts if we were to uh, strike the word likely. Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, as staff mentioned during the uh, presentations, uh, the question and answer period, um, the likely was associated with some concern about, you know, it was an, a, a quick kind of uh, crossing over, uh, something like Davis, where we had the truck crossing over for 10 seconds, really, you know, and no response at all as it goes over the median, made us feel more confident about that. Um, 
this case, we have some fatigue that we couldn't rule out, but the, the vice chairman is correct too. We didn't feel strong enough that we made it a finding either. Um, you know, it's not unprecedented. Uh, the Chattanooga truck accident where we had meth methamphetamines and a fatigue driver, we use likely uh, because we couldn't rule out other sources of inattention. Um, having said all that, uh, staff would defer to the board. Uh, you know, we think this is this is a judgment call and we would defer to your position. Well, thank you very much. Member Graham, uh, go ahead, please, sir. Yeah, I, I got one question on that. I know uh, you brought up the Davis uh, probable cause and I did read that uh, between questioning rounds. But I did uh, notice uh, one of the specials brought up uh, the Concan, Texas, and the uh, Cooper Township, Michigan, uh, probable causes. And in both cases there, they did not say likely. They said due to, and the, and the crash was the impairing effects on the other one, and due to the impairing impairment. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I wasn't aware of those until just just now, but uh, I wonder if staff has some qualifiers on those statements in the probable cause. Again, um, staff has um, not used the word likely in cases where we don't have any other explanation. Uh, you know, it's always a probable cause. There are things that we may have no evidence for that can happen sometimes, um, but we typically will look at crashes that involve inattention and look at fatigue, look at drug impairment, look at incapacitation um, or medical factors. Uh, in those others, we didn't have other factors that we were couldn't completely rule out. So we went, we felt positive going with the absolute. Uh, in this case, we, like I said, we had the fatigue factor that we weren't sure we could completely rule out. So we qualified it with likely. Um, and as I mentioned in the Chattanooga case, uh, Gray Summit, we have a driver who was distracted by what we believe likely texting, but we couldn't really tie that exactly to the time. And we know he was bending over, so it could have been reaching for something else. So when we have an alternative uh, possibility that, mm -hmm. that is not necessarily likely, but is there, we try to use the word likely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I've been around, around this place for, for, for probably too long. And so I've gotten used to hedging and saying likely and things like that. Um, you know, it's just part of part of the vernacular that I'm used to. Uh, I, I will certainly support this. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do, unless there's any significant discussion, I'd say let's uh, let's move on. And uh, because we've got plenty of daylight in this report left. And so uh, uh, I would be willing to call for the question if that's okay and move on. Um, so member Graham, if you'd kindly restate your motion um, and, uh, and then we can uh, proceed to a vote. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment is to strike the word likely from finding number three. So finding number three will read, the pickup truck driver's crossing of the center line occurred because of his impairment from use of multiple drugs. Okay, that's the motion. It's been seconded. Any any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Board members voting to approve the motion will vote aye. Those approving or those moving, those voting against the motion will vote nay. Vice Chairman. Vice vote. Chairman votes. Right. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice, Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Uh, member Hominy votes aye. Member Hominy votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. The motion to amend finding three has been adopted. It, are there any further uh, motions? And it's been adopted unanimously. Um, I should say, yeah, that's good. There's no nays, so it's unanimous. Are there any other amendments to the findings? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the findings as we just revised. So moved. 
Vice Second. Chairman has moved. Member Hamidi has seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The findings have been unanimously adopted as revised. So, Mr. Curtis, if you'd please read the proposed probable cause. Yes, sir. Staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the Randolph, New Hampshire crash was, a, was the pickup truck drivers crossing the center line and encroaching into the oncoming lane of travel, which likely occurred because of his impairment from use of multiple drugs. Contributing to the crash was Westfield Transport's substantial disregard for and egregious non-compliance with safety regulations. Also contributing was the failure of the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles to revoke the pickup truck driver's Massachusetts driver's license when notified of his loss of driving privileges in another state. Thank you very much. And I think we have a motion. Uh, a member, um, Vice Chairman, are you going to make a motion? Uh, I am, sir. I am, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, like to um, revise the probable cause, striking the word uh, likely, so that it reads as follows. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the Randolph, New Hampshire crash was the pickup drivers crossing the center line and encroaching into the oncoming lane of travel, which, strike the word likely, which occurred because of his impairment due to the use of multiple drugs. Everything else reads the same. Great, and I just want to uh, clarify, you did read it at the end there. I think you were just trying to abbreviate. You said um, due to his use, but I think you- I'm, it, it I'm would sorry, be because, because of his, uh, impairment from yeah, the use okay. because of his of his impairment from use of multiple, multiple drugs. drugs and then the contributing uh, statement would would remain the same uh, that's the vice chairman's uh, motion is there a second for that second uh, that was member graham seconded uh, any discussion uh, i will just offer uh the previous discussion i don't think we need to overdrive the nail here sir uh but if anybody wants to go farther uh, um, i have a whole list of drugs which i think has been pretty thoroughly covered and um, the fact that uh, i don't think we have much doubt on this the other point is and this is for the staff if there's any uncertainty uh, we are covered by the statement that this is a probable cause not an absolute cause That's right you're right, sir. Thank you. I'd love to hear from the staff. I think we've really heard, but uh, staff, uh, Ms. Dr. Malloy, I would like to hear from you, please. Absolutely. And um, given the discussion we've had already, uh, staff supports the change to the probable cause. Thank, thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the probable cause as amended by Vice Chairman Landsberg and seconded by Member Graham, is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, just quickly, I think we're getting to the right result on this, but I do want to thank the staff because there was some discussion and, and some revisions made at an earlier stage on this. I think there was certainly an attempt to try to, to uh, resolve some of the concerns that several of us expressed, but I think this is the right result. and. Um, uh, and I thank the, the vice chairman for offering the amendment. Yes, uh, member Hamidi, please. Uh, just a point of clarification for process. Are you moving the probable cause as amended or are we voting on the amendment first? Well, good question. Given that his motion was to, to do it, to amend the entire probable cause by striking the word likely, uh, I'm, I'm proposing that we, well, that's what his motion was, uh, was to amend the probable cause as as he read it. So, but I want to make sure everybody understands. 
to be very clear, um, Vice Chairman, tell me if this is correct. Your motion, well, in fact, you you read it. If you would have continued to read it, you would have read how the probable cause would, that would incorporate your, um, your amendment. That is exactly correct, sir. Uh, okay. Any questions about that, Member Homedy? No. Okay, thanks. I uh, appreciate the uh, request for clarification. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the probable cause as read by Vice Chairman Landsberg, seconded by Member Graham. Seeing no further discussion, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homendy. Member Homendy votes aye. Member Homendy votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The probable cause has been adopted as revised. And so, Mr. Curtis, if you'd please read the proposed recommendations and per a phone call that we had at nine o'clock last night, just make sure that, that we all know what we're doing here. Yes, sir. I will first read the six new safety recommendations staff proposes in this report. There are three to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Number one, establish an additional layer of oversight of recent graduates of your new entrant safety assurance program that has a lower tolerance for unsafe operations. Number two, remove keep trucking electronic logging devices from the list of approved providers until the company has demonstrated compliance with federal regulations. Number three, Review and revise the certification process by which your agency approves electronic logging device provi providers to ensure that products meet federal regulations. One recommendation to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Number four, develop an appropriate metrics and establish a process to regularly evaluate the effectiveness of the Registry of Motor Vehicles processing of out of state notifications both incoming and outgoing for commercial driver's license, CDL and non-CDL holders. One recommendation to the Department of Transportation in 49 states, Massachusetts accepted, and the District of Columbia and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Number five, direct your state licensing agencies to review existing procedures or develop new ones to accurately and expeditiously, one, process notifications, received from other states about infractions and suspensions committed by the home state's drivers in those jurisdictions, and two, notify other jurisdictions of infractions and suspensions committed, committed in the home state by drivers licensed in those jurisdictions. And one new recommendation to the National Association of State Motorcycle Safety Administrators and the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, number six. Inform your members about this crash and remind them about the safety benefits of wearing U.S. Department of Transportation compliant helmets, safe spacing when riding in groups, riding unimpaired, and anti-lock braking system equipped motorcycles. I will now read four safety recommendations that are being reiterated in this report. One to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Recommendation 8-18-32, which reads, require all new motorcycles manufactured for on-road use in the United States be equipped with anti-lock braking system technology. Number two, to the three states with no motorcycle helmet laws, Illinois, Iowa, and New Hampshire. Recommendation H07-38, require that all persons shall wear a Department of Transportation Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 218 compliant motorcycle helmet while riding, operating, or as a passenger on any motorcycle. Number three, to the 27 states, commonwealths, and one territory with partial motorcycle helmet laws, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Maine, Minnesota, Montana, New Mexico, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, Wisconsin, 
in Wyoming, the Commonwealths of Kentucky and Pennsylvania, and the Territory of Guam. Recommendation H-07-39, which reads, amend current laws to require that all persons shall wear a Department of Transportation Federal Motor Vehicle Standard 218 compliant motorcycle helmet while riding, operating, or as a passenger on any motorcycle. Number four, to the seven states, commonwealths, the District of Columbia, and two territories with universal motorcycle helmet laws regulations not specifically requiring FMVSS 218 compliant helmets. Alabama, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, Nevada, and West Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, the District of Columbia, and the territories of Northern Mariana Islands and the Virgin Islands of the United States. Recommendation H-07-40, which reads, amend current laws to specify that all persons shall wear a Department of Transportation Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 218 compliant motorcycle helmet while riding, operating, or as a passenger on any motorcycle. Staff proposes reiterating and classifying the following safety recommendation to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Recommendation H-16-1, which reads, review the process and procedures for imminent hazard orders to identify ways in which this process can be improved to work more swiftly and effectively when implementing the improvements, seek le legislative authority for such changes as necessary. This recommendation is reiterated and classified as open, unacceptable response. Sir, that, that completes the recommendation package. Good, thank you very much. I'll accept a motion to adopt the recommendations as read. So moved. Vice Chairman moves, is there a second? Second. Member Chapman seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Uh, Chairman Landsberg, uh, so it's been moved and seconded to adopt the recommendations as presented, as read, and we will, there's no further discussion. So Vice Chairman Landsberg, your vote, please. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. The recommendations have been approved unanimously as presented. We'll now move to, um, let's see. Wow, moving right through this thing. Does anybody have any additional areas uh, that they would like to discuss regarding this report? The, the, the one thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, I went on the website of the uh, Keep Trucking web, uh, Keep Trucking ELDs, and uh, I'll have to admit, it's a very nice looking website. Um, looks very good, and uh, it's disappointing that they did not cooperate with us very well. Um, it's also disappointing that they have manufactured an ELD that can easily be negated. And, you know, we only investigate the tip of the tip of the tip of iceberg of accidents. There's literally millions of crashes, highway crashes in this country throughout the nation. And we only look at perhaps, what, Dr. Malloy, maybe 10 to 12 a year. That is correct. We do about 12 to 20 investigations a year. Okay. So we're only looking at just a, a very narrow slice of all crashes that occur each year. And yet we found two of them that had this type of ELD, a keep trucking ELD, or a predecessor to that manufactured by keep trucking that could be negated. And so... Um, I wonder, couldn't help wondering, if the name Keep Trucking is named that for a particular reason. And you hear the F-16s flying by to support that. I don't know if you can hear that or not. So, anyway, 
Uh, do we have a motion to adopt the report as revised? And the revision that we had, of course, was in the area of the uh, the the, um, the probable cause and the uh, the findings, finding number three. Do do we have a have a motion to adopt the report as revised? So moved. So moved by the vice chairman. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by member Chapman. Any discussion? Okay, moved, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the final adopt the report as revised. There's no further discussion. We'll go to a roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hominy. Member Hominy votes aye. Member Hominy votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The report has been adopted unanimously. Do any of my colleagues wish the right to file a concurring or dissenting statement? For the record, uh, it appears that no one has um, plans to do that, and I don't either. So, as we prepare to wrap it up, those participating in the board meeting are invited to turn their cameras and mics off if you like. In closing, um, I want to thank my colleagues on the board for their uh, for their preparation going into the board meeting and uh, and for the good debate and the good discussion. It's obvious to me that a lot of work has gone into this. I can tell that my colleagues are getting into the docket. They're really studying hard. They really want to really want to learn the issues and and do the right thing. And so, thank you for for a great board meeting. Our special thanks goes out to the entire investigative staff from the Office of Highway Safety, as well as the Office of uh, Research of Eng Engineering. I always say, though, that nothing happens at this agency with just one person or one small group. It truly is, it truly is a group effort. I mentioned that I was uh, on a phone with uh, Brian Curtis at nine o'clock, along with the managing director, along with our uh, deputy general counsel at nine o'clock last night. But then when I realized that my computer wasn't working, uh, I had to get one of our IT folks on the phone at 930 to help me get that straightened out. So <clears throat> we've got uh, the ability to do these webcasts uh, is, is amazing. So thank everybody for making this happen. The program, support staff, members who made all this possible. The recommendations that we issued today, if acted upon, would result in additional oversight for recent graduates of the FMCSA's new entrance safety assurance program. They would result in non-compliant electronic logging devices being removed from the approved list and would, pre would prevent other non-compliant devices from being approved in the future. Furthermore, they would result in the states taking a fresh look at how they process interstate notification of infractions and suspensions with an eye to accurate and speedy processing. Likewise, if the motorcycle safety recommendations we iterated today are acted upon, ABS would be standard on new motorcycles and the states would require the use of FMVSS 218 compliant helmets by riders and passengers. And let's be clear about this. This crash was caused by an impaired driver in a combination vehicle crossing the center line and striking the motorcyclist. It was not the lack of motorcycle safety features that caused the crash. Although, as we did point out in one of the findings, it did potentially mitigate some of the injuries on a few of the bikes. We all know that motorcycle safety features and protective gear greatly improve a rider's chances of survival in a crash. The states that don't do the states don't do riders or passengers any favor by making helmets optional. Likewise, motorcycles should not be sold without ABS. 
which gives the rider more control in an emergency. I want to thank you all. We stand adjourned. <laughs>